So hey everyone and welcome back. We're going to get started with the advanced track um, right now. And the first session is Data Type Generic Programming by Andres Le. Um, if you have any questions, you can ask them in the advanced channel on our Discord instance. Um, so yeah, have fun. Thank you, Jasper, for the introduction. I should also point out uh, that uh, Duncan is also in this call and he'll um, sort of moderate a little bit. So if, if you ask questions on the advanced channel on Discord, then he'll try to uh, forward them to me and yep, uh, interrupt me. Interrupt and, and ask ask questions on your behalf. Yeah, uh, OK. In the channel, if, you, if there's lots of questions, upvote each other's questions, and that'll help me uh, prioritize which ones to ask Andres. Cool. OK, so let's get started. So um, welcome, everyone. And um, uh, thanks for joining to this session on data type generic programming. Before um, we really start, I would like to say just very few words about well-typed. Um, I'm like uh, Andres from well-typed. Well Typed is a Haskell consultancy company that exists now for, uh, for more than 10 years. It, it was established in 2008. And we're currently about 15 Haskell experts. And we're all working remotely, uh, mostly from Europe and the uh, US. And um, we are helping various companies that are using Haskell with, uh, uh, like, for example, training courses like this one, which we do both on site and remote, or uh, software development and consulting. And uh, one particular thing that we're also doing is we um, do general work on the Haskell infrastructure and on GHC. And um, yeah, so we are at the moment, unfortunately, not hiring because we've just finished the hiring round. But uh, but we are always interested in interesting projects. So if you have anything that you think we might be um, a good fit to do, then you are very welcome to contact us at info at welltype.com. And in particular, also, we are looking for companies who might be willing to sponsor um, more GHC development or, or maintenance in general. I think there um, is a, a need for certain tasks that are um, not so much fun to do for volunteers. And uh, so paid work works better for them. And um, it would be great to have some more support. So if you're interested in that, then please contact us as well. OK. So that was that. Um, I, I will do all the rest of, uh, of the session in um, uh, live coding, essentially. Uh, there is a repository, a GitHub repository, which contains some materials for this session. So you don't actually need to clone that right now. It is like more important for later on. Um, you um, can basically just listen to what I have to say. But I briefly want to. Um, show that it is at github.com well typed and then it's called gp zero hack 2020. I've put the um, repository link also on the advanced channel in Discord. And uh, I will commit the code that I'm going to write during um, this session to that repository. But I've also prepared sort of clean snapshots of the code, which is already in here. So um, if everything goes wrong during the session, uh, then at least those files should work. And there also is some lecture notes, if you want to call them uh, like that, so gp.pdf, which accompany this um, uh, essentially the session. So that's an extended uh, version of, of the session I'm going to do. So if you want to read up some things later on, um, then uh, you might want to look at that. And there are exercises in that. PDF as well. So it um, it looks like this. And uh, it's quite long. It's 40 pages almost. And it has some exercises. I will otherwise not do exercises during the session. Um, but if you if you later want to work through it and, and ask questions about the exercises, I'm happy to answer them. OK. So <clears throat> what I wanted to do in this session is uh, to, to talk about generic programming from an implementation point of view, actually. So um, I wanted to explain to you essentially how you can uh, design a library in Haskell that does more or less the same things as GHC generics does. 
and um, and then I want to change that library in steps in order to turn it into something that more or less does the same what uh, another generic programming package does that's called generics SOP. And by doing this step by step and changing things step by step, I hope that we have quite a bit of time to look at sort of the, the implications for um, the design or the feel of the generic programming library, the implications of various decisions that you have to make along the way. And the design space is very large, I have to say that in advance, because uh, yeah, even though we do this step-by-step -step approach, there will still be many aspects that we simply don't have time to, to go into. And um, I mean, one could easily make multiple sessions out of this and um, would still not have covered everything. But, but we will basically try to, to look at, at this. So to start with, what is generic programming? Well, the idea of generic programming roughly is that you want to define functions that work over many different data types in a similar way. So um, you, can, you can think of it as being sort of in between what parametric polymorphism and on one hand and, and type classes on the other hand give you in between those two extremes because parametric polymorphism essentially says you have a function that works on um, many different data types in exactly the same way, right? And uh, with type classes, you have a way to say, I have a function that works on many different data types, but essentially on all of them in possibly completely different ways. And you can, of course, establish certain laws, and but you then in Haskell at least have to check yourself in order to try to get some more regularity into it. And then generic functions is, are, are sort of in between where you say, yeah, well, there is something about the structure of the data types, and I would like to exploit that structure. And, uh, and and from that structure sort of derive the functionality. And it's not going to be exactly the same behavior for all the data types, but it's going to be very systematic behavior. And if you look at a example data type like this tree type that I have written down here, um, that's a good example for um, like, yeah, how a data type definition Haskell can look. And if you write down a data type definition like this, then you're introducing new names, right? Haskell has a nominal type system. You're saying you have a new data type, tree of A, is going to be different from everything that has been there before, even if there is another data type that has exactly the same structure, that also has a tree-like structure, a binary tree-like structure, and a leaf-like constructor, and a node-like constructor, it's going to be different, right? And this, this nominal nature of Haskell's type system is slightly in the way. So the idea of generic programming is to, to remove that temporarily and to go to a more structural view and to, to abstract from the names for a bit and to expose the structure and ideally to expose the structure in such a way that it can be represented using just a few constructs or just a few types so that we can use those few types in order to like um, attach a specific functionality to it, and then from those few types, um, get something that that works on a whole lot. Um, let's fill that with with code uh, that uh, talk. So I'm talking about something like a class generic of A, which um, should contain many many Haskell data types. Ideally, we would want to have all Haskell data types in there, but that's unfortunately not realistic. Um, and then we'll have um, an associated type called rep of A that is going to be isomorphic to the original A, but exposes the structure somehow. And that, that's what we're going to talk about a lot. And because it's supposed to be isomorphic, we're going to have two functions from that go from A to rep of A and two that goes from rep of A back to A that are supposed to be inverses and witness this isomorphism between A and rep of A. So how could such an instance of generic look for tree of A? So we're going to start with essentially the view that, or toward, going towards the view that GHC generics is taking for this. 
And that is to say, well, if you have a choice between two constructors, that is more or less the same as what the either data type in Haskell is doing. So if um, if you want to, if you have either A, B, then it basically says it's well, it's either something of type A or of type B. And that is more or less in capturing the idea of a data type that has two constructors. And if we had more than two constructors, we could apply nested versions of either to get a choice between multiple different constructors. So in this case, we have a choice between two. So we're going to say something like either this or that. And then, well, the leaf is just an A. So here we are going to just write down the A. And the node is like has two components. And again, we're going to say, well, whenever we have multiple components or multiple arguments of a constructor, we're going to use pairs and not triples or quadruples, but nested pairs. Again, the idea is to reduce to few different constructs. All right, so we're going to write, like, because the node con consists of two components, we're going to write a pair of two things here. And now what do we put in there? There are recursive occurrences of tree of A. And this is already one of the biggest design decisions for generic programming at all. Um, what do we do with recursion? So we could somehow try to recursively expand the representation now, but then we would get an infinite type synonym and we would have to work around that somehow. Or we could try to introduce some kind of fixed point combinator that would capture the recursion explicitly. And that is what quite a few generic programming approaches do. Or we could just leave the recursive occurrences alone and write tree of A here again. And even though we then have only unfolded, if you like, one layer of the tree structure. That is enough to expose common uh, structure, and this actually works out quite elegantly. But as I said, I mean, this is already like a big decision if you if you do if you do something like explicit fixed points or not, and uh, and we're going to completely disregard for the remainder of this session all the uh, various generic programming approaches that that do treat fixed points explicitly. Um, are there any questions so far, Duncan? Yes. So uh, one question was why why can't we just derive generic for all data types? Or why is it why not can't we just derive generic? So I mean, first of all, we've just introduced this class, and uh, I know we're we're filling it with uh, with meaning right now. Um, in the end, indeed, I mean, this class is going to be one that you want to be derived automatically. I mean, and all other classes are ideally expressible in terms of it. So um, uh, de derived automatically either by template Haskell or by the compiler. Um, you cannot really hope, uh, well, I mean, let's see. You cannot really hope to represent all of them because um, like the, first of all, there are reasons why you might not want to expose the generic structure of certain abstract types at all. Like something like IO or so should probably never be in the generic class because it's so deeply ingrained into into the sort of uh, uh, into the language and and, and 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 totally abstract so you you wouldn't want to represent that but even apart from those there are practical concerns of certain data types are just very diff difficult to represent gadts themselves are very difficult to represent and and types that have existentials are relatively difficult to represent. Not impossible. I mean, there are these days, there are approaches that can do it. But you have to do quite a bit of extra work. And there's always a trade-off between like how complicated do you want the whole machinery to be and how universal do you want the whole machinery to be. And um, so um, we're going to, again, we're going to follow roughly the lead of GHC generics at this time. So the elaboration on the same question is, why do we even bother having deriving for generic NF data that are typeable, et cetera? Wouldn't it be great if these instances were created by the compiler automatically and completely implicitly without writing deriving explicitly? The the question also is, you know, library authors not providing natural instances is a real problem, is the, uh, the statement. It's, it's, a, it's a good point. I mean, one, one could do that. I think there are, I'm, I'm usually a fan of being, explicit about these kinds of things. But I mean, like typable being derived essentially automatically these days, one one could um, one could envision a, a setting in which generic would automatically be derived for all data types. But again, 
even if it was automatically derived, there are good reasons why you might sometimes want to hide this representation because it might give you access to, to internals of a data type that um, as a library author, you simply do not want to have exposed, right? I mean, uh, for the same reasons, you might want to make certain data types abstract. You might also just want to um, uh, shut down the possibility by other people to to exp like, uh, uh, to access the, the generic representation. And then another question, uh, is rep supposed to be a common abstract type for all the instances of generic? Um, yeah, it's an associated type. Um, so that means, um, well, I mean, it always has the same name, but in every instance of generic that we're going to define, we're going to give a different implementation or a different definition of rep for for that particular um, type. I hope that so this is a type family and not a single type. Yeah, it's, it's like a type family, but inside of a class. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, so now that we have uh, the generic instance. Um, let's uh, let's define from. So from on tree would then be like we we'll have to be from tree A to rep of tree A, right? Which in turn is either A or uh, of pair of two trees. And it's very straightforward. I mean, it's not very difficult to to write this. So if we have a leaf, then we go left and produce that X. And if we have a node. Then we go right, and we have the L and the R. And um, two is just the other way around. So. By the way, <clears throat> I mean, this is using instance signatures, but I should probably also just in general say I have enabled all sorts of language extensions, and you can look at the GitHub repositories which ones these are. Um, I don't want to bother in, in this time around with, like going to the top of the module and, and having to enable uh, new language extensions all the time. So I basically assume that everything is enabled, everything that is, exists in, in GHC at all. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this is our um, generic tree um, instance, okay? So the next step is to define a generic function. And I'm going to go with one of the classic examples again, which is uh, equality. Equality is a derivable type class in GHC. So of course, you, you never really have to write it as your own generic function. But if a generic programming library is any good, then in particular, it should be able to express uh, structural equality on, on data types. And the idea is that we want to write something that is of this form. So when a type is generic, we want to go from A to A to bool. And we want to somehow, if we have two arguments, A1 and A2, we want to use this from operation to go to the structural representation and then have some generic operation that operates inductively on the structural representation. And now this generic uh, representation is, is constructed using um, a few special data types, like either that we've used to express constructor choice or pairs that we've used to express choice between, um, sorry, a combination of constructor arguments. And in order to define a function essentially by type case over these, we are using a type class. So I'm going to introduce a, a helper class for the generic equality that I'm calling, calling GEQ. And I want that um, the representation of A is an instance of GEQ. And GEQ is going to have a GEQ method and that I'm calling here. So GEQ of A um, is also A to A to Google. And this one we're now going to have to define for a bunch of different types. All right. So step one, we need an instance for either. So if we have GQA and GQB, we should be able to say GQ either AB. And here we really just have to implement equality ourselves on, on either. I mean, I could even have like used deriving for this, but it would be uh, not very, uh, let's say, enlightening in the general setting because equality is so special. But um, but we really have to just implement what, what does it mean for two either things to be equal? Well, OK, so if they're both left, then we use GQ on A's. 
if they're both right, then we use GQ on these. And if there's anything else, then it's false. Okay. We'll also need an instance on pairs because in like um, line 20, you can see up here, uh, we have a, a pair uh, of two trees in here. Um, so we'll need to do that as well. So if we have GQA and GQB, we can have GQ of A comma B. And if we have A1, um, B1, and if we have A2, B2, we can do GQ A1, A2, and GQ B1, B2. Right, at this point, we can wonder like, okay, is this already enough? I mean, what we want in the end, right, is to say something like, okay, we'd like to define an actual equality, not G equality instance or trees, by just setting the equality method to our EQ thing that we've defined up there. And at this point, we're going to get an error message from GHC that says, no, that doesn't work. We, I couldn't deduce GEQ of A. And that makes sense, right? Because at this point here, in our structural representation occurs an A. And what do we want to do with the equality for that A? Well, we would like to use the equality of A's. I mean, we cannot, we cannot really um, expect that uh, this will work if A itself is not an instance of the equality class. So we would like to sort of inherit the equality on A's. So, but how do we get the equality on A's over to the GEQ world. We cannot, even though it would be tempting, really write something like EQA, GEQA, where, because this would be an instance that would be overlapping with everything and it would be asking for all sorts of trouble in the long run. So what we'll do instead is we're going to make our representation slightly more complicated. We are going to wrap the constructor fields um, in, a, in a separate thing. I'm literally going to call this wrap, wrap of A is wrap of A. And all the constructor fields that occur in the representation, I'm going to wrap in wrap. So, I'm going to do this for these trees as well. Because similarly, as for the A, for these trees, we basically want to inherit the instance of equality we're just about to define. So, so the idea is that for the wrap things, we want to like um, go to already existing uh, uh, functionality or functionality that we're just recursively defining. What's the present well, of wrap? Can clarify yeah. here. There's a question about that's going on about why are we using either? Why why are we defining things for either? There's some confusion about this. Perhaps okay, so I've introduced clarify. either as one possible choice to represent uh, or one possible option to represent the choice between different constructors. We, I mean, the, the whole point is we, we want to use a few Haskell data types to represent like all sorts of different data types, right? And uh, generally, Haskell data types can have a choice between an arbitrary number of constructors. Uh, but if you like, uh, if you just write a data type um, in, in Haskell syntax, there is no language construct or no uniform thing you can, you, in which you can talk about this. But with either, you have one data type that like expresses essentially nothing but the choice between two constructors. So it is well suited to represent a choice between two constructors as we have in tree. And as I said, if we had the choice between multiple constructors, we could use either repeatedly in, in this representation. And, um, but of course, I mean, there is no need to like to do, uh, to use either. You could also use a choice between three things. It would just lead to a like weirder, um, uh, representation, or you could define your own Haskell data type that uh, is not called either, that uh, has a choice between two things, but is isomorphic. And uh, it, it's not it's not as if either is magic. We are just choosing it at this point. I, I hope that answers it. Uh, 
Um, and while we pause, there's a related question here. Um, yeah, I, I, this may be hard for one for me to read out because it requires um, some. Yeah, some I'll, I'll go on and, and do some uh, simple changes while you're reading the question to me. Okay. <laughs> so the question here is Is there a reason why the representation is defined as th th the rep of tree is defined as either a tree or you know pair, pair of trees rather than um, using rep? wrapped around the um the sub trees so what is it so in particular why are we using a that is that is coming that is coming back to uh to what i said before about how we how how we represent recursion right and uh and i said one of the options is to to uh, like expand recursively the definition and indeed we could do that we could we could write rep of tree here in, in principle we could try to write that but at that point we would have a, a recursive type synonym right and that would like lead to an infinite type and in haskell that is not allowed and and then if we wanted to prevent that we would have to introduce a, a new type something so that the recursion goes through a new type but then we have a, a nominal construct again because this new type constructor would have to be different for every uh instance of generic that we're defining and that kind of defeats the purpose of of trying to treat everything uniformly and and there are things around this and you can you can still do this you can do this deep expansion if you if you want if you if you do a little bit of trickery but um but doing a shallow like um i'm just doing works and it is sort of what GHC generics also does so it is uh, currently our target point um, I yep. hope yeah, I hope that answers it uh, can I yeah. go on or do you yes. have more yeah, carry on. yeah okay yeah. all right so um so I've adapted the uh, the generic instance to to the presence of wrap and uh, at this point, uh, everything else still works, right? But I have to now define a new instance of GEQ for rep. But the good thing is that this one is what I wanted to define before. Here I can now say I can um, give GEQ for rep of A if I already have a normal EQ instance for A. And then if I have rep A1 and rep A2, I can just piggyback on, on the normal equality. And then, as you see now, my my equality instance on tree is actually type checks, right? And and it works as uh, expected. I mean, I, I can try to see if I um, there is not very interesting stuff I can do, but I can try to compare to example trees. That are actually equal, and then I can try to make them not equal, and um, so so that's a that's a start. Okay, now what's next? I mean, we have basically the beginnings of a generic programming library now, right? We have a data type, we have a generic class, we have um, an instance for the generic class for one example data type, and we have. Um, uh, one generic function that uh, follows this general scheme that we will see more often that we have first we have a, uh, a little uh, wrapper that that invokes a type class based version of the generic function in this case called geq and uses the um, from and to functions as needed in this case we only need from uh to to uh convert between the original data type a and the structural representation rep of a and then geq is this type class that works on the representation and it has to have instances for the kinds of things that occur in the representation and the currently this is either and pairs and wrap this is a little bit implicit and that's perhaps also partially the reason why there's been a question about this like i mean it feels like i mean in principle geq is a class over it, it feels like it's a class over any haskell data type and we have to give instances for the things that occur in representations but what occurs in representations is just something that we implicitly agreed on right it's not written down anywhere explicitly that representations have to be built out of either and pairs and wrap and that is indeed one of the disadvantages of this current approach and we'll We'll get back to that, um, but uh, but not right now. 
So can, um, um, just ask yeah. a couple of things. Um, can you clarify the distinction between the normal equality and GEQ? So someone's asking, you know, why couldn't we simply define, you know, parentheses equals equals the, no the normal equality to be equal to GEQ? And then, kind of related to that is where does where did GEQ for tree come from? That was another uh, another question. Okay. Um... So the, 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 the latter one is, I think, easier to answer. So where did GEQ for tree come from? Here, in the end, we're defining um, equality for trees. We're defining equality for trees to be EQ. EQ itself is defined in terms of GEQ on the converted arguments. And GEQ um, on the converted arguments exists because we have instances for all the things that occur in the representation of trees, which is either and pairs and wrap. And um, the wrap instance in particular then goes back to EQ, which is a little bit weird, but this is this idea of tying the recursive knot, where essentially only unfolding the structural representation of the top layer of the tree data type, we're dispatching to the GEQ uh, class methods, and uh, and then when we hit the next layer, we're going back to EQ, and it's a little bit of a back and forth between EQ and GEQ. And now the other question was, if I understood it correctly, why we couldn't just like collapse the two things down and have just one type class and uh, and do everything on EQ. And in principle, we could I, for, for this particular case. We'll later get to situations where we cannot. But I think it would even, I mean, it, it might sound simpler, but it would actually even further blur what is actually going on. I mean, it's already, in a way, a little bit of a problem of this approach that quite a few things are implicit. And, but really, we are, we are conceptually moving between two worlds. Right, and even though both are represented as Haskell data types, we have the normal Haskell data types and we have their structural representations. And just because they currently have the same shape, um, and you could collapse these things down, doesn't mean that you should. I think it, it would actually not make things clearer, and um, and and separating them out is. Is, is probably better. And we will later get to situations where there's really a need to because the, the structural representations have different um, types or, or different shape and, and, and the GEQ class is no longer compatible with EQ. But um, we'll have to wait a bit until we get there. So uh, a closely related question here that's just came up maybe, but I think perhaps you've already answered it, but you can just clarify that, that this is indeed what you meant. So the question was, is the GEQ, GEQ class seems superfluous because we only have three instances and couldn't we have just inlined it into um, the structural equality? And I think what you're saying is, yes, you could have in this case, but in general, no, and it helps to make this distinction. Um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, there are two readings of that question, and with one reading, I've already answered it indeed, and the other may be uh, slightly different. Um, but I, I mean, if inlining means inlining into the EQ class, yes. yes I mean, you, we you could, mean, we could, uh, yeah, we could have in principle deconstruct. Yeah, but I want. I mean, as I said, I mean, I want to highlight the. The, the operation specifically that we're doing on these structural representations. And I ultimately want to like um, blur less the distinction um, between uh, normal types and structural representation types. And currently, they are relatively close together. But we'll, we'll, we'll get to a point where they're further apart. And, and I think that ultimately helps understanding and clarity. You may disagree, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> OK. Yep. Okay, let's um, define. I mean, let's let, let's let's do a little bit more so that we have a bit more material. Let's let's do one more data type and let's do one more generic function. Um, so let's do a very simple so-called enumeration type color, which just has two con uh, three constructors: red, green, and blue. Right. That that is a data type that might occur in um, in a Haskell program. And let's give a generic instance for this one. 
color. So we need type ref color. And, uh, and here we already sort of hit a little bit of a problem because, okay, we said we want um, either to have a choice between constructors and now we have actually three constructors. So we have to somehow make a choice how to nest the either's. And I'll just pick one option right now. We, we may be talking about this again, but let's just pick any option. And then, but the, what what to put in these in, in at the positions where I now have the underscore because we have constructors that don't have any arguments and I, I mean and don't have anything that we could put in wrap. Right? There is simply nothing there, and there's also not multiple ones. So we need a we need a new thing here in order to represent a constructor that doesn't have any arguments. And uh, the simplest thing is to use unit uh, for these. Um, but again, you could also define your own um, copy of that. Sorry for that one. Oops. Um, and then, of course, at this point, uh, you can already see we've extended, again, sort of implicitly, um, our language of, of things that can occur in representations. And GEQ would now need an instance on, on unit, right? Um, so we would have to define a GEQ instance on unit. Um, let's actually perhaps do that right now um, before we forget. Um, that one is easy to write because there's only one value of unit, and comparing unit and unit is always true. And I again need a from that goes from color to red color. And from of red is just left unit, and from of green is right left of unit, and from of blue is right of right of unit. And two is again just the other way around. Um, let me actually make a little bit more space here again so that you can see slightly more of the code. So two is going from red color to color, and it's just the reverse mapping of from right of left of unit is green and two of right of right of unit. Okay, and at this point we should be able to just use equality on color um, by saying instance eq color where equals is eq. That works now because I have already written this extra instance, right? But um, but now we can uh, represent any any constructor without any constructor arguments that should occur in any other data type. So um, equality on color is fine. Now I want to define another generic function that is um, uh, slightly different in nature that is uh, sort of related to what the enum class does. And I will actually also call it enum that um, just takes um, a value of a type. And uh, no, sorry, it does not take anything. It's, a, it's not even a function. It basically is just an operation that produces a list of all possible values of a type. And uh, I, I'm going to restrict enum. I mean, I'm, you, can, you can try to enumerate values of interesting types. But I'm going to like uh, make a similar restriction here for this session as GHC itself makes for deriving enum, that um, I'm only going to use it on data types that are actually enumeration types, whereby enumeration type, I mean a type like color that has just different constructors and none of the constructors have any arguments. Um, so the shape of enum will be the same um, as before for equality. So we have generic A, G enum is a class we're going to define. And we're going to use G enum on the structural representations. And then we'll use two in the end to convert back from the structural representations to the um, original Haskell data types. And because the results are in a list, I'm going to have to map to over that list. And um, so a genom is going to be a class method again of the genom class, where genom is um, a type list of that. And now again, I need different instances. I certainly need an instance for either. 
So um, if I have T e num of A and I have T e num of B, I want to have T e num of either A, B. And well, perhaps this is actually not the easiest one. Perhaps it's the easiest one to define as the one for unit. Let's, let's start with that one. The enum for unit. Well, if we want to enumerate all values of the unit type, that is very easy. There is exactly one of them. And if we want to enumerate all values of an either A or B, we have to enumerate all A's and all B's, and we have to prefix all the A's with left, and we have to prefix all the B's with right. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to map left over G enum, and we're going to map right over G enum. And the type checker is going to figure out that like this invocation of G enum here is on type A, and this invocation of the enum here is on type B, right? So um, that's all happening by type class magic. And now we're done, right? Um, so we don't actually need to look at an instance for pairs or for wrap or for anything else, because um, our enumeration types um, implicitly again, I agree, but um, the way I said that they are only going to have constructors without any arguments. So the only things that should occur in the representations are either and unit and nothing else. And um, I mean, it's good that it's a static error if you're going to try to call genome on trees, for example. So that's good, right? But it's not a very readable static error. So if I, I mean, for, let's first perhaps do a successful example. If I want to do genom on color, um, oh, um, no, not genom, enum. Um, ah, no instance of show. That is true. I'll, I'm, since I'm not having a generic function for show written right now, I'm going to derive show for color. So try again. OK, so that um, works as expected. And if I try to do this on tree of, I cannot put A here, unfortunately, but on tree of int, for example, I'm going to get that I don't have a genom instance for pairs, essentially, which is true, because the tree representation contains pairs, which is a evidence that this isn't actually an enumeration type. And while this isn't at all a readable error message, it is still good that it is uh, a static error, right? Because we wanted to restrict this to the subclass of types. But again, the problem is that this is slightly, um, slightly vague and slightly impl implicit. So we we have to know a lot about how these representations work in order to figure out which instances to define. And that is perhaps not ideal, but it's still cool that we can do it at all. Um, any questions at this point, Duncan? Yes. Um, so one simple one is, um, how do we test that that these uh, to and from conversions are, are right? Is it is it really just as simple as you know, the round trip test of to compose from and from compose to? Yes, essentially, yes. I mean, uh, the idea, of course, I mean, you're right. I mean, there there are still options to make mistakes, right? I mean, for example, we could we could accidentally sort of flip the order between two constructors here, and um, we have to be we have to make sure that this is done right. And, and indeed, the round trip testing would be a good way. And in the end, the generic class is always one in all these different approaches that you would like on the one hand to be so simple that it is easy to really build into a compiler or to write template Haskell code for or whatever you like, right? And on the other hand, you also really would like it to be auto-derived so that you cannot make any mistakes and you don't have any degrees of freedom and you can really rely on that. But but yeah, in, in, in principle, you would have to prove that it, it actually is an isomorphism, um, or at least an isomorphism modulo undefined. Um, yeah. And then the um, uh, the, the more open-ended question of, is the performance question. Uh, what, what sort of performance overhead in practice can we expect with generically derived instances? Um, they're saying in small um, examples like tree. Yeah, I mean, that sure is overhead would be not noticeable, but for more complex types, nested either's, nested tuples. Yeah. 
Yeah, that is a, that is a that is a reasonable question, but one that I would like to defer a bit longer. I'm I'm going. I mean, I'm not going to talk about performance very much, but I'm going to talk about performance a bit. And when we reach the point where we actually have GHC generics, I should remind me, Duncan, if I don't, um, I should briefly mention something about performance and, and at okay. the very end, ideally, as again, yeah. Sure. Um. Um. Okay. Uh, so, um, right. One one more thing before before we um, uh, reflect on essentially um, GAC generics and, and and how it relates to what we have. And uh, there's one more thing, and that is one thing that we haven't discussed so far is what about constructor names or data type names or record field selector labels or whatever. And I said in the beginning, OK, uh, we want to move from a nominal to a structural view. But even if we take a structural view and we want to treat different things uniformly, there are still operations which somehow need or want access to this, what I call metadata about data types, which is the, the names that are around. And to a certain extent, also other information, like which module a data type is defined in, or whether a constructor can be used in fix, and if it can be used in fix, what, what uh, priority it might have, and these, these kinds of things. And for example, for, for show and for read, which are, which are probably the classic examples of, of uh, derivable uh, type classes that that make use of all this information. Uh, you you really if you if you want to like give a, a straightforward textual representation of your Haskell data type, you 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 want to have access to the to the constructor names. And I'm going to limit myself to constructor names today, even though data type names and uh, and other information and record selectors and so on can be handled in a in a in a slightly similar. Um, or yeah, in an essentially similar way. And um, if you want to add constructor names, um, well, first of all, we should have a goal. Perhaps um, the goal would be to write a very, very, very simple, because otherwise it will use too much time, the generated form of show, which is um, called con name, constructor name. And it takes an A and it produces a string. And of course, it will again have generic A, and it will probably have G con name of A. Um, I'm going to, and I mean, I can even write it this far: G con name of from of A, and G con name will be a class method. Um, and what should it do? It should take. Um, well, why does it not yet work? Oh, because I did not pass the argument here. Uh, and then it still does not work. Prep of A, yeah. What should it even do? It should um, it should print the name of the outermost constructor of the value that we we are giving it. I mean, not walk any deeper and not do anything with potential constructor arguments. But if we give it a a node of a tree, for example, regardless of what comes underneath, it should print node. If we give it a leaf of a tree, it should print leaf. If we give it uh, uh, the, the color red, it should print red, and so on and so forth. That um, That is a simple generic function that needs access to the constructor names. So we're going to use that as, as our example. And we're going to have to extend the, the generic representations with that information. But um, we can extend it still in a way that is uniform by adding a new um, uh, type that appears on our representation for constructors. And I'm going to call that con. And con takes two arguments. One is the name of the constructor as a type level symbol. And one is whatever structure is underneath. And in the actual term level representation, we disregard the name. We just have the A. So it is really just a marker at, to which we can abstract, uh, attach, sorry, uh, attach on the type level the, the names of the constructors. And we can just see how we are going to use this in here by saying con of. Um, so we do this underneath the either structure when we know in which constructor case we are, but outside of the product structure, essentially outside of the 
of the of the fields of the constructor. So here we have the leaf, um, right? And here we have the node. And then, of course, because like even though it doesn't carry any actual meaning, we still have this con constructor on the term level as well. We have to unfortunately, um, uh, oh, sorry, this was the wrong way around. Um, add con in the right places to our um, representations as well. So this is a bit of tedious work. While I'm doing the tedious work, Duncan might want to ask me another question. Doesn't have any. Okay. Um, so for color, we need to do the same thing. Or later, there's also an error here with the equality. I'm going to get to that. But here for color, we're going to say this is red, and this is green. And again, this is, of course, a good reason for why you want to auto-generate these, because it's easy to make mistakes here, actually. Right? I mean, to flip the order or misspell or um, so. this part, the from and to functions are then very straightforward. It's relatively difficult to make mistakes there. OK, and now we have, again, extended our representations with a new building block. Right? We have now have either's and pairs and unit and wrap and con. Right? Um, and because these now occur in all the representations, our already existing generic functions don't work anymore because we now need to add cases for con. Right? So GEQ needs a case for con, even though it's a trivial case. So GEQ on NA and GEQ, we don't want to do anything with the constructor names. So we simply um, pass by and go to the go to the structure underneath. And similarly for enum, um, we also need um, uh, we also need an instance for the uh, constructor names. Because these actually occur between the either's and the units. So, um, uh, so again, g num a, g num con, and a where g num is con mapped over g num. And then the the functions that we have so far they work again. And um, then. Uh, now we can we can look at how to define con name itself. And of course, the most interesting case is the one for con. So let's define that one first. G con name of con n a. So at this point, we are not actually interested in whatever is underneath. We're only interested in this n here, and we want to turn that n into a into a term level string. And there is a GHC class for this that's called known symbol. That is always satisfiable for any um, for any some for any concrete symbol. So it's not actually a, a real constraint. Um, it just um, has to be uh, mentioned in order to be able to call this symbol val um, function. And then symbol val expects a so-called proxy, which we can apply at type n, and that gives us the the name that we want. Um, I don't know, perhaps some people are wondering why we put this name on the type level if we ultimately need it on the term level. Um, uh, if so, that is a valid question. But the point is that really it is a name that is statically determined. So it's something that the compiler knows. And here in, in, in GCon name, we are in the like, sort of privileged situation that we get an input value of type A. So we would have the entire structure available. So if the if the con wrapper would contain the the term level string already, it would be fine. But in other functions, in other situations, we might have to produce values of type A 
And at that point, there is no way for us to like to conjure up a term level string and to know which is the right string. It is really information that should even in the in the in the producer case should be should be part of the static structure. And that is why the type level is the right the right place for for this information. Um, what other cases do we need next to gcon name uh, for con? We need a case for either again. So gcon name of a and gcon name of b implies gcon name of either a d. And um, and here we want to we want to really look at the the outermost constructor. Um, so if if we are getting a left of A, we're going to call gcon name on A. And if we're getting a right of B, we're going to call gcon name on B. Um, do we need any more cases? So that is a good question. Um, so perhaps we can try to, to call our function. What happens if we call con name on a node of leave x and leave y, as we have before? That gives us node. Quick, uh, quick question here is what what is the proxy at n? Um, okay, n? yeah. Um, so proxy is a data type in Haskell uh, or in GHC that is defined like this. So it, it um, essentially is just something um, that has just one value that is called proxy, but has a type argument attached to it. So if you want to pass a type argument to a function and no other term level input, then proxies can be used. And that is sort of the old way in which type arguments were passed. And more recently, um, uh, GHC has uh, like added a language extension that uh, is called explicit type application or type applications, just uh, type applications, which um, allows you to instantiate any polymorphic thing at a particular type by, by using this at and then the type uh, syntax. So basically, proxy at n means the same thing as proxy with a with a type annotation that we want to use the proxy at the proxy n type, and it's sort of a a compromise um, between using just the type application and and using the proxy with a type an annotation because it's slightly shorter to write for me. Um, we'll get more occurrences of proxy and type application. Um, it's uh, yeah. Uh, I think I could have explained this clearer, but I hope it's nevertheless OK. Um, um, while we're just pause for a second, one other question is, um, are, are we, or that there's various discussion about whether we're going to be heading towards some big reveal where uh, the, um, you know, all, all these extra bits of metadata that are in the tree go away, or is this something we have to live with? Um, that's a very, that's a very good question. And uh, I mean, uh, <sighs> So, yeah, I mean, we've almost we've almost reached the point where we can we where we basically can sit back and reflect on what we have now, and that is certainly a part of it. So, um, so let me just before I go back to that, let me just finish up. I mean, we 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 really have implemented gcon name now, and con name also works on it works on trees, it works on colors. Right. I mean, it, um, even though it has only two cases, it, it works on all these different types. So, so having few cases doesn't necessarily mean that a, a function is 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 not applicable to a wide uh, to a wide variety. The reason why con name works on on all these types is that the the con case itself does not have a requirement that a gcon name a instance must exist. So we really just traverse the structure up to that point and then we stop. And it doesn't matter what is underneath, right? So, um, so yeah, we have we have seen um, three different functions now, and we have seen a variety of representations. And we're actually at a point now where we are relatively close to what GHC Generics is doing, and where we can reflect about this approach a bit. So, GHC Generics is essentially following this approach, only that it complicates some things a little bit more and generalizes some things slightly differently. So the main difference in practice is that if you look at GHC generics, that the 
Um, it can represent types of kind star or of, of kind type these days and of kind type to type um, separately. So there are two generic classes, generic and generic one. And one thing that I have not yet discussed and is that like um, generic, as we have seen it so far, is very suitable for deriving type classes like equality and show and read and enum and all sorts of variations of that theme. But there are other type classes like functor or um, traversable or foldable or these sorts of things that are parameterized over, over types of kind type to type. And uh, uh, this representation that we've seen so far is not really suitable for that because we don't get first class access to a parameter. And if we wanted to do that, then we would have to change things slightly. And that is something that GHC wants to do. And is explained in slightly more detail in the in the accompanying text as I uh, as I can give room here. And then basically the trade-off is that because GHC generics is using these type-to-type uh, -type representations for the generic one class. It reuses them for the for the normal generic class, so that it doesn't have to introduce two sets of of different representation constructors, like either and either one or something like that. So it reuses the same, and then it uses cryptic names for all of them, like um, uh, symbols and constructor names that are called L1 and R1 and this and that and that. But in principle, there is a direct correspondence between all of these. And then it has a slightly more systematic handling of metadata, where um, it doesn't go away, but at least like multiple uh, uh, occurrences of metadata. So there is an additional metadata constructor here that would be essentially giving you the name of the data type. And if there were um, record field labels, they would be here around the wrap. And so that you don't have all these different cases to write, it, it uh, groups them all together in, into essentially a single metadata top clause. And if you have a generic function that simply wants to disregard all metadata, you have to write just one case rather than three or four cases for all the different kinds of metadata. But yeah, um, let's now briefly discuss advantages and disadvantages. So, so the like the advantage of what, what we've seen so far is, is relatively straightforward. I mean, we've taken about an hour to get to this point. I mean, there are a number of concepts to discuss, but nevertheless, it's relatively straightforward. Also, the type level stuff that we need is still relatively tame. I mean, type families to a certain extent, um, but apart from that, there, there aren't all that many um, complicated things. The, the, OK, these symbols here for the, for the constructor names, perhaps. Um, it's uh, it's nice that we can like have this general pattern where we can define generic functions by means of the um, this, this this helper type class. Um, but yeah, but there are also some disadvantages. And uh, like one disadvantage is, for example, that uh, that we need to always like cover uninteresting cases. In particular, that we need to cover these metadata cases for a lot of functions that don't have them. That is one disadvantage. A more substantial disadvantage, in my opinion, is that if everything is so implicit that, I mean, we, we are mapping to these representation types and we use certain type constructors there. We use either rep, con, and pairs. GHC uses uh, a, a fancy pair product, like pair kind of thing, a uh, lifted uh, either and and, uh, and, and uh, some metadata wrapper that is called differently. But essentially, there's the same ones, but it's equally implicit. I mean, there's just hopefully in the documentation, if somebody has written it, uh, there is a list of all the things and an informal description of what kind of representation GHC is actually generating. But it's relatively tricky to figure out, like, have we covered all cases? Have we forgot something? And if we have forgotten something, then we'll get a cryptic error message and we'll have to debug it. And, um, and sort of encoding certain shapes, like enumeration types or, or other particular data types. And this is very um, subtle, perhaps, right? And, uh, and, and, and sometimes writing particular kinds of generic functions may be, may be tricky due to that, because 
um, you're yeah you, you're basically assuming heuristics or 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 hidden knowledge about the kind of representations that are being generated. If GHC ever changes the way in which it generates those representations, everything will break. Or other people may even accidentally jump to conclusions and assume that certain things that they have observed are always true, even though they aren't, and they start exploiting them, and suddenly they run into uh, into a situation where where something breaks due to that. So, um, so we we've reached essentially sort of the, the checkpoint of where we are at the closest point to what GHC generics is doing. And we're going to move on from here now, trying to like gradually um, transform the approach to like possibly remove some of the weaknesses that we've identified. But I've promised before that I would say something about performance. Just, so, just um, yeah. Since we're at this sort of pausing point, one of the very important questions earlier was: uh, Are we planning to take a five-minute break at some point for people to <laughs> recharge their cups of tea and coffee? Um, so you may want to decide um, when to do that. Yeah, I'm not so sure actually. <laughs> I um I can I can see the the need of some, but on the other yeah, hand, there's, a question uh, there's the also I mean I've been I'm, I'm happy to get lots of questions and to answer lots of questions. So um, are there a lot of questions now, for example? Then I can I can promise to to take five minutes of questions and if some people want to use that to have a break this or... uh, there's not a huge number of questions at the moment okay. um there was some discussion about you know proxies but that was um no yeah. there's, there's not a substantial number of I questions mean, perhaps we can take a break at a slightly later point sure uh, yes your, yeah. your call okay um yeah, so one, one thing I promised earlier is at this point to briefly talk about performance. And uh, so <clears throat> first of all, of course, there is overhead. I mean, one can see it. Uh, so um, we, are, we are having these uh, generic representations, and we are having conversions between the original data types and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and these representation types, and, and clearly, if we do not optimize, there is no hope um, that a generic function is anywhere near as efficient as the handwritten specialized version would be. Now, the question is, how bad is it in particular if we take into account um, uh, GHC's optimizer and inliner? And there, my answer is, I mean, I don't want to be too positive, actually. But my answer is it could be worse. I mean, so it's not as bad as it might seem, because there are some things that work in our favor. So one thing that works in our favor is that we have chosen um, to like um, have this shallow representation. And as a consequence of having this shallow representation that mentions the original tree type in here, our from and to functions are non-recursive. Right? They don't from doesn't call from and two doesn't call two. It really just does a one layer traversal. And these are trivially inlineable as a starting point. Okay. So that's that's good. So in particular, if you do if you do from and then immediately to, you have good hope that GHC can optimize it away completely. So what about the stuff in between? There, what is at least working in our favor is that everything is based on classes. Um, so basically, we are doing a dispatch over to a type class, and the type class resolution happens statically. So, um, so GHC will statically figure out which instance for this representation type to use. And in principle, again, like most of these instances are, well, they are recursing on other instances. But if you look at them in on their own, they are not actually recursive. So they are still inlineable. So there is the static um, uh, uh, resolution of the type class instances and quite a bit of inline potential. And these things, they work in our favor. And I would say for a lot of relatively simple generic code, GHC is rather good at eliminating quite a bit of the overhead. Nevertheless, um, some people are 
sometimes saying like yeah if you just like turn up the the threshold high enough and uh, if you like uh, uh dash 07 then it, you're guaranteed to always get perfect code that's not my experience there are certain kinds of generic functions for which it most of the time works but this is all based on heuristics and there are inliner thresholds that can always be in your way and um and i don't trust it and my my experience there is that there is going to be some overhead so if something is enormously performance critical then it may not be the right thing to do but many things aren't actually extremely performance critical and also even if if there's a little bit of overhead it may be it may be acceptable, but you have to measure it. And the other thing is that, of course, the, the, the big inlining potential works negatively on compile times. So, um, so um, GHC is, is sometimes slow at even generating these generic instances. That is yet again for slightly different reasons, because the, uh, like the kind of uh, terms that are being generated there have a certain a structure that due to the explicitly typed nature of GHC's core language often leads to a slightly degenerate behavior. So deriving generic instances can, for large data types, take a surprisingly long time. And there's been some work on that, but I think the problem is not fully solved. And the other issue is, of course, that just the, the inlining itself is a rather untargeted um, uh, thing so you're you're tempted to to like even like increase thresholds but that of course means that GHC does a lot of inlining attempts and not always successful so it spends a lot of extra time inlining stuff and compile times go up and GHC is already not the the fastest of compilers um, uh, but nevertheless I would say relatively speaking and also considering where we are going to today GHC generics is actually one of the better um, approaches when it comes to performance. Like, I mean, um, generics SOP, which we're going to end up is worse, at least in its current form. I will hopefully say something about potential future work in the very end. Um, uh, but uh, uh, generics SOP is worse. So if you if you already can't live with GHC generics in terms of performance, then you should probably not look at generics SOP. Um, and uh, SYB and, and these kinds of approaches are also worse. Um, so, um, so it's uh, the, in, in general, GHC generics is already comparatively good. But there is there's more to be said. And uh, uh, if we have a few minutes at the very end, I, I can I can do some more reflections on on performance and the future of uh, of generic programming and its performance. Hopefully. Um, do we have any other questions right now? No, people are commenting on, on the performance stuff, but I think you've, um, okay, you've covered it. Cool. And the good. person who wanted their coffee has gone and got their coffee anyway. So yeah, yeah. All good. Um, so what is the next step? So perhaps I mean, actually also a good point to, even though I have these other files in the repository to, um, to commit what we have. So um, GHC generics checkpoint. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to address that's what I what I've said now multiple times about um, what kind of types occur as representations being essentially implicit, and um, and the the way that I'm going to address this is I'm going to define a new kind. Uh, that is specific for all the things that are representations. I'm going to call that kind representation, data representation. So with the GHC promotion, right, um, if uh, you, can, you can define a data type and then treat it as a kind and treat the constructors of the data type as types. That is what I'm doing here, but really, it would be better, and I'm not sure what the status of this is right now. It would be better if we could directly define it as a kind. I think this is, uh, this is still not possible, um, but it will hopefully be possible at some point um, because I'm, I'm never going to use it on, on the term level. Um, so um, 
So what kind of representations do we have? Well, we have representations that are sums. So I'm going to give slightly different names to these than now. But um, the either, right? I mean, either is essentially a, a algebraically a sum of two data types. So I'm going to write this here corresponds to either. We have um, constructors, and they have a symbol and a representation underneath corresponds to con. We have um, pairs or products. Corresponds to pair. We have um, unit. That has no further structure. And we have um, wrap, which I'm going to call atom here. And um, that contains a single type. Okay. That defines a kind. And um, the good thing about this kind now is that it is closed. So um, I'm going to say that is a good thing, because even though in our exploration so far, we have sometimes hit the point where we have seen we need to add a new thing to our representations. That is, has been coming from this incremental nature of our examples. But it's not what's going to happen uh, over and over again, ideally. I mean, it shouldn't be that um, a random person uh, writing a library and defining a new generic function discovers that they need a new um, uh, representation type. Because that would mean if that would happen all the time, it would defeat the purpose of, of writing generic functions. And all the other generic function authors would have to add a new case. Ideally, there really is a, a limited set. Whether we have now got the complete set or not is an independent question. But there ought to be a, uh, a, closed, um, a closed set um, of, of, of things that can appear in, in representations. Do you so want to just the, yeah? the, um, this type type? Where did that come from? People are wondering. Uh, that is essentially the same thing as star. So, um, so because I'm because I'm using this as a kind in the end, the representation is going to be a kind. Sum is going to be a type that uh, takes two types of um, uh, kind representation to a new type of kind representation, and so on and so forth. Atom um, is something that is actually going to wrap a normal Haskell non-representation type of kind star, uh, which I'm going to write type instead, um, which is like these days is possible, right? If you so import type data of is kind, simply the, the new name for, um, for yeah. kind. And, uh, and then you can basically uh, apply atom to int or atom to string or atom to um, uh, whatever pool and, and and form a representation that way. Um, yes, and um, and indeed, I mean, if we look at the um, where, uh, if we look at the generic classes actually up here, I'm going to change the generic class slightly in the sense that we are now going rather than to associate the representation with a type, we're going to uh, represent what I'm going to call a code with a type, which is of kind representation. So, um, and I'm going to comment out all the rest of the file for the time being, because we have lots of errors now. <clears throat> but we're going to recover all that, hopefully. OK. So <clears throat> perhaps just to keep an example around, let's look at the, the tree instance. And let's copy that up here. And let's see how that would look. I mean, um, from and to are, are not yet what we're going to do, but just the representation. Right? We would, this is code of tree of A now, and this essentially just renaming. So rather than either, we're writing sum. Rather than con, we're writing constructor. Rather than wrap, we're writing atom. Rather than con, we're writing constructor. Rather than wrap, we're writing atom. And rather than wrap, we're writing atom. And rather than the pair here, we are writing product. <clears throat> 
people are wondering if your representation type, um, I mean, it's excluding the function arrow. Um, mm -hmm. is, that, is that deliberate? Is this something um, There are with? lots of types we are effectively excluding. If you think about it, we're also excluding int. <laughs> But, but the function arrow is, is particularly interesting indeed. I mean, so um, <clears throat> function arrow is still representable as an abstract type, but, um, but it is not representable generically right now. And indeed, it is some one thing that we have, have simply disregarded. Um, I mean, there are, uh, th there are some other abstract types that you sometimes would want to include. And indeed, it's it's a good point. One could one could try to add the function arrow as an additional thing. Um, it, um, uh, I yeah, I have to like let's say I have to make certain concessions to the to the time constraints that we are operating under in the session. So that is basically the the, the main the main reason why it's why why it's disregarded here. But also, it is. Let's say function arrows are often posing immense problems on various generic functions anyway. So, um, so a lot of a lot of the things that you typically want to define generic functions over don't extend over function arrows in in, in a very nice way anyway. So, so it's perhaps not even that that big a restriction. But it's it's a good point. I mean, it's it's one of the many things one could try to do differently. Um, so. But as I said, I mean, if a function occurs, one could still, I mean, if one has an instance for something elsewhere, right, one, one could still just, I mean, um, have it as an atom. Um, one can just not generically traverse it. Um, yeah. Um, OK. So this is our representation now, which has representation kind. But we still have from and to, and we still want from and to. We still have to convert between a type and an isomorphic type. So we still need something like this rep. We still need a way to map a representation of representation kind to something of kind type that we can actually use in order to uh, to convert our A to. And we can do that by interpreting this representation using a type family. So I can write type family interpret that takes a representation and gives me a type. And there I can essentially go back to the kind of things that we had, only that I don't actually need all of them. So if I have a sum of R and S, uh, sorry, if I want to interpret a sum of R and S, I can still use either and go either interpret R, interpret S. If I have a constructor, okay, I could go and say I, I interpret this as con n r. But I'm actually going to interpret this directly as r because we have this intuitively we have this code now, which is a type of kind representation. And that already contains this information about what the n is. And we don't really have to duplicate that n again in the representation. So we, we can simplify there slightly and um and, and have less overhead around, and we'll see how that plays out. For product, I do need to use my pairs again. And for unit, I uh, still need to use unit. Um, for atom, I can also just use A. Again, I don't need to put an additional wrapper there now. Right? I can. I can just use a. We'll we'll see how that plays out again. So the the, the, the interpretations become slightly easier, and um, and so what is rep now? That occurs up here. I can define rep as a um, uh, as essentially the interpretation interpret of the code of a. Um, oh, and here I was missing a recursive call as I've seen. Okay, so far a type checks. I'm getting a warning here that from and two are undefined. So we should look at from and two next. And these are actually becoming simpler now. From is going to no longer have to mention rep and con at all. 
And here we just have a pair of L and R. Similarly, here on the left hand side, we just have left X. Here we just have. So that is um, our um, like first attempt to, to rewrite a, a generic instance for trees. We could rewrite the generic instance for colors in, uh, in much the same way. And um, well, yeah, actually, we should go on. And we should try to see whether we can adapt um, uh, the equality class or the equality function as well accordingly. So, so this changes slightly because um, we now want to say that the code of A should be in GEQ. And GEQ will now be parameterized via something in the representation kind. And we're going to say this is going to go from interpret R to interpret R to go. And um, now we're going to run into one of the disadvantages of our new setup. And that is if you look at the, the type of GEQ, it mentions R only as an argument to a type family. And here we run into this typical thing that type families are not injective. And GHC therefore cannot in, like infer what R was by just seeing interpret of R. And, um, and that is going to bite us whenever we call GEQ, because GEC can then not really infer at which type we are actually calling GEQ. And um, uh, there are multiple ways around this. One way around this is to not use a type family at all. By the way, I mean, this type family is actually not injective, right? It's not just a question of, um, of, of uh, somehow annotating it with an injectivity annotation, but it is because we have ripped out these these trace markers con and uh, and wrap, we have actually uh, multiple different um, values of kind representation that can map to the same target representation. So that is on the one hand convenient because it makes from and to so much nicer, right? But on the other hand, it uh, it, it, it bites us here. Um, could you could you elaborate one more time why interpret was introduced, and and remind us again how rep yeah. code and interpret relate to each other? Right. Okay. Um, so representation is a kind that we have introduced in order to specify exactly which types can occur as representations, but um, it is itself not a kind that has any types. Right. Um, the only inhabited kinds in GHC are type and constraint, actually. So whenever you define a new kind, uh, uh, it doesn't have any, um, oh, sorry, it has types of that kind, but it doesn't have any inhabited types of that kind. So if you write some, some unit unit, that is a, uh, a type of kind representation, yeah, but it doesn't have any values. In order to say, how the values look like, we need something else. We need to somehow relate this representation kind back to the type world. And one way to do that is, is using a type family. Another way to do that would be to, to write a GADT that was indexed over, over something of kind representation. Um, uh, but but we, need, we need a way to actually um, have something that we can right here, because we still want to transform a tree into an, an isomorphic representation, and that needs to be of kind type again, right? And uh, we need something there still. Um, so uh, this may look just more complicated as before, all right? But the advantage or the reason why I've done it is because it makes it more explicit whether we've covered all cases, right? It says from the very beginning, all the all the things that can occur in representations must have sort of a, an, an origin in this representation kind. There are no, there are no other things that can occur in representation types, and, um, and that's that's the main that's the main reason why we're there. Okay. Um, 
Thanks. Yep. Um, yes, and basically, I've already hinted that. I mean, so we we could go, for example, to a GADT rather than a type family, and 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 write the interpret thing as a GADT of sorts, or we could use a data family, or or something like that. Or we could just accept the fact that it is non-injective and that we have to add explicit type arguments when we invoke GEQ, which is what I'm going to do here. I'm going to like um, accept this. Um, and then I need to quantify it over A here. Um, I think this is not so bad in this particular case, because GEQ is ultimately only an internal function. Right. I mean, uh, outwardly, we're only going to use EQ in the end once we've defined our generic function. And it does serve nice documentation purposes anyway to, to say, like, at, at which type we're calling GEQ. So it's, it's not that bad. So how do the um, instances change? So we have some A, B here now. And I mean, ideally, I would even perhaps say, change the letters so that it's clearer that we're going to operate on representations now. And then I have to say that I'm calling GEQ on R here and that I'm calling GEQ on S here. And uh, then this one type checks. Good. I think we, we are not going to need wrap and con anymore, so I'm going to just delete them. So then let's look at the um, pair thing. Again, I'm going to use R and S now. And here I'm going to say product rs. And then I have to recursively call x type r and to recursively call x type s. Here, instead of rep, I have atom now. And rep no longer occurs as a constructor on the term level. We just get a1 and a2. And this one becomes very simple. In fact, I could even write this in eta reduced form. So, um, uh, because really now the the interpretation of the of a and atom a is the same. Right? So we um, don't have to wrap unwrap constructors anymore. Um, the unit case. I just need to change this. And in the constructor case. Constructor, let's call it R because it's a representation. Again, the con doesn't actually appear anymore. And here I'm going to call GQ on R. And again, I could either reduce this if I wanted to. Just at a different type, called at a different type, but with the same shape of arguments. That's why we can pass them on directly. And then let's see if this one still works, but it does. So it just type checks now. And then for uh, practice, we can try to do the same thing again for colors, but that should hopefully not bear too many surprises. So um, <clears throat> for colors, um, code of color, this is a sum now. This is a constructor now. This is a unit now. This is a sum. Constructor. Unit. And this is another constructor. And this is another unit. And from um, is from and to are going to just become simpler because we don't need the cons. It complains about the patterns before it complains about the right-hand sides. That's just an artifact of, uh, sorry, of GHC's direction of or order of checking various different things. Uh, um, So that works. Quality on colors should work as well. And then we get to the point where we have, um, where we want to rewrite enum. So what about enum? Um, that should again be the same code 
Um, Enum I have not yet defined. Genome should be on a representation now. This is here. Um, and then this should be interpret of R. And um, again, we need to explicitly say at which type we're calling this. And all these should be similar to what we did in the equality case, only that we have fewer cases for genome, so it's not quite as bad. So <clears throat> here is constructor, and the con is no longer needed. We need to annotate this one. I should call it R for consistency. And then for either, this is R and S. And this is R and S. And we need to explicitly pass this. Uh, and either should be some. Oops, I can. Okay. All right. I'm not going to do con name and uh, con ix right now, um, or I did only do con name before anyway, so um, th that doesn't add anything really. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is a nice vari variation of the theme perhaps. I mean, it's all in all um, uh, not too much worse, not too much better. I mean, it, it has this one advantage um, of of making it explicit what we are we are operating on, and there are now multiple directions in which we could go further, and we actually want to go further in both directions. And the question is just in which order we're going to do this, and um, I'm going to just pick one. But so one thing is that if you look at this, right, we have now said. OK, or even if you look at the representation kind itself, we've now said only these things can occur. right? But in practice, there's more. There, there are more constraints. Um, uh, they cannot occur in arbitrary combinations. right? Currently, this, this representation kind suggests that you can have a product on the outside and a sum on the inside. But in practice, that never happens. That's not how Haskell data types look. Uh, Haskell data types are a choice of constructors, first and foremost. So there is always going to be a sum structure on the outside. And then uh, the way that we constructed our uh, representations, there is going to be constructors at the leaves of the sum structure. And then underneath the constructors, there's always going to be a product or a unit structure. And then at the leaves of the product structure, there is going to be atoms. Right? We could try to make that explicit. Right, that's one one option, and we're going to do that in, in a moment. It's going to be a lot of work, unfortunately, but it's going to be a good step because it, it really um, removes a lot of stuff that is implicit before. The other thing that is enabled by having this explicit representation is to say, like, we have always defined our generic functions by means of type classes so far. Right? And Type classes are particularly suited to things that are open, right? because you can give another instance and another instance and another instance. But now we have a closed kind, a closed representation kind. So there is, is, is a clear limit of the number of instances we can possibly define. So perhaps we can actually, um, with a little bit of work, uh, make it so that we can define our generic functions using case rather than using type classes. And um, while that is probably a terrible idea for performance, it is actually quite a nice idea for removing syntactic clutter, right? Because even a simple generic function such as generic equality is still spanning quite a few lines, half of which are instance declarations, and the rest is. Um, as the code that we're actually interested in. And it would just look so much more compact if we um, well, if you could if you could do it as a case. And um, so I, I want to I want to look at this first. And um, uh, but perhaps there are questions. So it would also be a good moment for questions. Not a moment. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, all right, in order to um, do this, we're going to use a standard technique of type level programming, um, and that is singletons um, or singleton types. Uh, what is a singleton type? A singleton type is a way to communicate between two different layers, um, in, in this case, between the, the value, the term level and the type level. And uh, we're going to define a GADT um, in such a way that there is one value of this GADT for each value of kind, for each type of kind representation. It's easier to just do it than to explain it. Um, but we'll see that this is the property that essentially holds. So we're going to define S a representation. S is for singleton, which is indexed over something of kind representation. And it's going to have exactly one constructor for every constructor. And the representation type is going to follow the structure of um, the representation kind um, uh, to the letter, essentially. So we're going to have S sum which takes an S representation of R and an S representation of S to an S representation of some RS. And then we are going to have S constructor. This is actually one of the more interesting ones. So let's look at this one in a moment. And let's first do S product. This is going to also take an S representation of R and an S representation of S and to an S representation of product RS. And then we're going to have S unit, which is going to take or produce an S representation of unit. And then we're going to have atom, and this is another interesting one. So for the constructor, we have something that is not a representation as an argument. We have the symbol. Right, and the question is, what do we do with that? Um, so it's clear that we want S representation of R, and we want as a result that uh, we want S representation of constructor N R. But do we want something for the N? And if you think a little bit ahead, I mean, I could. If I had more time, I would show it as yet one extra step. But if you think a little bit ahead, um, we would do. We want to define ultimately a generic function by pattern matching on a value of this S representation GADT. So this is going to tell us in which case we are in, whether we are in the case for sums, whether we are in the case for constructors, whether we are in the case for products. And the different cases correspond to what before were the different instances. And if we are in the case for constructors, we may want to refer to the name of the constructor. And in order to refer to the name of the constructor, we need a known symbol constraint on n. n and we also need to pass a proxy of type n to the symbol val function if we want to actually generate it. So it makes sense to include these here, known symbol of n and proxy n for convenience. And they don't really block anything, because as I said before, known symbol is always satisfiable. So we're, even if we are not using in a particular generic function the constructor names, having this extra constraint there is not going to do us any harm. It's more problematic here for Atom, because I mean, again, by default, we would now just say we have an S representation of Atom A. But what do we do with the A? Um, S atom, sorry. And I'll I'll keep it like this for the time being to just ignore it. And here we're actually going to see where where it where it breaks down. If we um, so um, S representation can stay uh, as it now is for the time being. The generic instance is also unaffected because we haven't actually done anything there. But we're going to change the definition of equality. So let's comment all this again. Going to change the definition of equality. And I'm focusing primarily on GEQ now. So GEQ is going to become a function that is going to be defined on S representation of R. And then it's going to take interpret of R to interpret of R to dwarf 
And then it's going to be defined by pattern matching on S representation. So all these things that are instances down here, this one, for example, this one for sums, it's now going to become a part of this function. But for the sum case, And now we can actually explicitly um, call on R and S again. I mean, well, that's a good thing as a matter uh, or is, is questionable, but at least it I mean, is uh, at less uh, syntactic overhead. For products, we get this one. Um, what is it complaining about now? Different numbers of arguments. Oh yeah, because there is still a GQ here. Sorry. Um, and then, um, <clears throat> so that's this sum case done. Uh, then we need the, the case for atoms. Um, needs to be spelled out now again, of course, because again, uh, we must not need different arguments. And actually, the one for Atom will pose us with the problem. I can actually show that right now before I before I complete. If we, if we sooner or later will reach the case for Atom, and there we will get to this situation where we want to say that, and um, Atom doesn't have any arguments right now. And then we'll get an error message that says, could not deduce EQ of A arising from a use of equals. And that is true because if you if you look at the the instance um, that we have down here for atom, we require TQ of A, and we now in this setting we have no way of getting access to an EQ of A constraint. And for known symbol, I have embedded it here, and of course I could also um, do a very dirty trick and embed the equality constraint here, and then equality would work, but it would be cheating really right because now our s representation type would be specific to the equality function and for every other kind of generic function i might need a different s representation type and these are tedious to write and you certainly don't want to do that so if this is going to be any good at all we have to have it usable for for many different generic functions so what can we do instead because we will in general for the atoms need to require possible instances or constraints. Well, we can abstract over that constraint that we are requiring on A here by saying C of A rather than EQ of A and making this whole S representation thing parameterized over a constraint. So now C gets um, type to constraint argument. And then everything gets an extra C argument, but the constraint is always just passed on for changes. Everywhere where we have S representation, we have S representation of C. Okay. And then here, we can say we want an S representation with an EQ constraint. And here it makes sense to specialize to EQ because we are in the setting of the uh, equality function. And you can already see, even though it's still like I haven't covered all cases, but the, uh, the error is gone. So there is, no, um, there is no problem now with using equals equals here because we have been sort of passing this equality constraint through the representation. And indeed, we can now complete this. So um, what, what's still missing? Um, unit, we need unit. Sorry. Um, so S unit. And what else is missing? Constructor, I think. Let me just write it here. S constructor N R A1, A2 is GQ of R of A1, A2. And then let me bring these in, in sort of the order in which they occur top to bottom again in a data type. 
and this is the this is the final function. And then how does our wrapper look like in the end? And so um, this is this is of course still a problem because if we actually have EQ now, um, well, we need to if we even disregard the type signature, we need to invoke GEQ. Right. And in order to invoke GEQ, we need to come up with this S representation value. And writing that down by hand is, of course, completely infeasible um, because it's sort of a potentially huge structure. But we can use a type class in order to generate this. And that's a sort of a standard component of, let's say, the theory of singletons. Right? Um, if you look at Richard Eisenberg singletons library, there, there's all this stuff as well. Um, so um, as you can define a type class that goes with the uh, with the singleton, I'm going to call that one is representation. It's parameterized over the same things. It's um, of type as it has the constraint argument, which is type to constraint, and it has the representation argument. And it has a single thing that is going to give us this S representation of C and R. And the instances are all very boring. Representation, sorry. So <clears throat> how do the instances look like? Let's start with the one for sum. If we have is representation C, R, and is representation C, S, we can also get its representation C of some R S. If you have to produce an S representation value for a sum, well, we use S sum, and we recursively use representation to do the one for the result uh, for the for the arguments. And now we have to complete this, unfortunately. So this is uh, sort of the most painful part of this lecture, I'm afraid, because we have a lot of writing to do for comparatively little gain. Um, but perhaps it's a good moment for Duncan to ask me more questions while I'm doing this typing, if there are any, or is everybody already lost? <laughs> uh, no, no, um, got a couple. Does S representation replace representation, or do we need both. It does not replace representation, even though it is boilerplatey. I mean, so this, you you could, of course, I mean, you could go yet a, a level higher and say, shouldn't the computation of S representation or the derivation of S representation be done by a generic function? And uh, because it's essentially a generic construction for a for a given kind derive um, the, the the correct singleton type. Uh, unfortunately, it's a generic construction at a different level, and we don't have a that powerful system right now that we could sort of do do something like that generically. So it is, uh, yeah, it is boilerplatey, but uh, but it is uh, in principle you need this only once, right? Because if you agree on a if you re agree how your representations should look like, you you need to have this uh, the singleton type to go with it once. If you want to con consider defining generic functions by by case, like, like we do here. Um, if you don't want that, if you're happy with the classes, which is fine, right? Then um, uh, then then you don't need it. And in general, I mean, I I should perhaps say, I mean, why I'm doing all this, this step by step, I, I want to show a little bit like what are the what are the implications of the various changes and how big is the design space? I'm not saying that everything is always only getting better, right? I mean, that is ultimately judgment that you have to make for yourselves. And um, there are multiple sweet spots within the design space of generic programming that are comparatively good. And GHC generics that we've already been at is certainly one, I mean, uh, uh, right. I mean, you can you can hate the naming conventions that it employs, but uh, but I think it is still there is a reason for for why it's done the way it's done, and and that is because it is, is relatively good. But there are other good points in the design space, and um, uh, we'll we'll hopefully ultimately arrive at one if if our time um, is sufficient. Um, but I'm 
optimistic. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, and the other questions that came up, you answered as you went along. So I think uh, I think we're good. Sorry, what? I said the other the other questions that came up, you answered yourself uh, in the oh. in the usual flow. So. Okay. And no further questions then at the moment? Uh, no. Um, so here I need a proxy for the N and um, and then a call to representation. And I do need a non-known symbol N constraint also on the this representation um, class. And then the other interesting case is the one for Atom. So in order to define its representation of C for Atom A, I now need that C of A holds, that is the abstracted embedded constraint. And then the representation here is just as Atom. Okay. And if we have that, we have a chance of writing this wrapper for the equality. So because now here, we can require that we have its representation of EQ of code A. And then we can invoke GEQ with um, something of, um, of, of type S representation. And in order to compute that, we're going to invoke lowercase representation at the type um, that is the, um, well, actually, I mean, at EQ and at code A. Yeah, that type checks. Oh, I'm glad. Um, that would have been tricky to debug if it, uh, if it hadn't. But yeah, OK. So, um, so that's it. So let's, let's copy this up here. Right, and then we have EQ and DEQ together, and, and that is that's not so bad, right? I mean, again, this has this has other disadvantages. Um, uh, for example, in terms of performance, we've just become a whole lot worse pos potentially because now we've turned a what I said before, like a class-based dispatch mechanism, into something that is really just a single recursive function, right? and uh, and this is not going to be inlined. Um, and uh, so, um, but on the other hand, we have everything together in one place, and certainly for communicating the idea, um, this is uh, this is much nicer, right? And, and perhaps we can we can um, still uh, explore uh, a few things more, um, and then make it even make it even nicer. So in in practice, actually, there there's this other point that I said about the layering. Right and uh, um, sums and products cannot um, occur in any order, and that bites us if we do things such as generic enumeration in the same style. Because if we try to define generic enumeration in the same style, let's actually do that. What would we get? Well, first there is a minor um, question mark about what constraint to put here. Um, so um, I'll leave that open for the time being, because for, for Enum, we didn't have a class. Right? And, uh, and actually, we never even uh, hit the atom case in, in Enum. So what, what constraint do we put there? We can put, the, basically, we can put any constraint there. We could even leave it overloaded. But another interesting constraint to put there in such a case is top, where top is just um, uh, a trivial constraint that is satisfied by any type. So we, we don't need it. Similarly, you can use the class system to co combine multiple constraints into a single constraint. So this, this abstraction of is representation over a single constraint is not a limitation. Right? If you don't need any constraint, you can put top. If you need multiple constraints, you can combine them using a, a class that combines two constraints into one with a similar construct. It's also in the, in the lecture notes. Um, but it, it's essentially an aside for what we're doing. So, so what did what cases did we have in uh, in the enum situation? We had a case for s unit where we are 
um, just um, oh sorry this is this is still the wrapper um, so um, we wanted to do um, two mapped over g enum um, and g enum will again take a representation over top and over um, code a and g enum will take an s representation top and um, r and give us a list of interpret r's now i can Now I can start um, doing the unit case. So that's question. Can, can we use um, the unit type instead of top? Um, so GHC allows in a relatively hacky way to write down unit with kind constraints. Right? Um, if, if it's clear from the context that, um, that a something of kind constraint is expected then then writing down parentheses open parentheses closed is, is is fine and type checks as the empty constraint but what we need here is something that is parameterized right i mean it's it should be basically trivially true but uh but the the thing we're we're abstracting over if i go back to the kind is of kind type to constraint so it's not a plain constraint. And because we need this extra argument um, and we need to be able to partially apply it, um, I think the class is the best option. I mean, if you if you wouldn't need to partially apply it, you could also define something like top A equals unit as a type synonym, which is like essentially a constraint synonym then. But, um, but that doesn't work because type synonyms cannot be partially applied, but classes can be. Okay, thanks. Um, so what else do we need? We need a case for S constructor, which was essentially um, irrelevant. Um, so where we just um, call genom on R. And then we need a case for S sum RS. And um, in this case, um, what do we do? Uh, essentially, what we always did, we do left over g num on r plus plus, and I should put parentheses there because I never, I must admit, I don't know the relative priorities of these two um, of the map and the, but you probably need them. Probably need them. Um, <clears throat> right over, over that one. And then we're done, and that is a problem. To some extent, I mean, so it's nice that we're done, of course, but it is not nice because we now have a partial function g enum, right? It, it misses the other cases, and there aren't even really sensible definitions to give before we simply omitted the instances. And there is a real problem in the sense that when we before did um, call g enum, I may even have this here still. So if we do enum on color, oh, we don't have color. But, but I mean, I only want to show three anyway. Um, and then I don't have a show. It first complains about the show instance. That's that's fair, right? And then then crashes. Before, in the old style, it was a static error. Which is of course much better. If we if we want enum generically to only work on enumeration types, it should only work on enumeration types, and it should fail with a type error if we call it on anything else. So um, so this has become worse, right? Um, but all hope is not lost. Um, there are other options we have. And um, one being um, working towards the stratification and this layering. But there is another option which also independently is useful to discuss. And um, because we that is again enabled by the fact that we have this explicit kind in the first place, we can define another type family that um, uh, operates 
over representations and gives us a constraint. That's an interesting construction. Type family is that compute constraints. A constraint that tells us when does a representation have the right shape so that it belongs to an enumeration type. And um, how can we define this one? Well, this enum representation of uh, a sum rs is just okay. Sums are okay in an enumeration type, right? So then we just say is enum representation of r and is enum representation of s. And this is using sort of constrained pair syntax, right? Um, something's wrong. Um, what's wrong? Oh, S sum. Um, so here we're using pair syntax, but it's really constrained combination syntax, right? So um, because the, the result of this type family is a constraint, putting multiple things in a tuple means all these constraints must hold. And, um, and what are we going to do for constructors? But it's R, it's a representation, and that is the representation that is underneath a constructor. And we are simply going to say for a enumeration type, we want that R to be unit, equal to unit. Because nothing else should be allowed. Underneath a constructor, there must be no further structure. So we want, um, we want that to be equal to unit. So that's a type level equality constraint, which also has kind constraint, so it works here. And here we are deliberately leaving this partial, but this is a good form of partiality because we really mean that this constraint, this enum representation, should not be satisfi satisfiable if any other constructors are, is, is this is being called on any other constructors. It is not being called on unit anymore because we are not recurting here. So if um, if our, our structure is as expected, then then it should be should be fine. And then we can um, add that constraint here. For example, we can say it's enum representation of code A, and we can add that here as well. Representation. Of R. And now we have to change our definition slightly, but we can because now we know in this constructor case, we know that the representation is unit. So we don't even need to recurse one layer further down, but we can immediately here return this empty list, uh, this one element list with the unit in it. And that's fine now because the additional constraint we're getting from here is going to give us that. And um, that's going to work. And we're still getting a pattern matches or non exhaustive warning from GHC, which is fair, I think, is really expecting a little bit too much. Although I know that Ryan is, I think, among the audience. So here is something to do for you. You can extend the GHC pattern match checker to, to cover a case like this. Um, but uh, basically, yeah, GHC cannot recognize that um, like this could not possibly be satisfied in any of the other cases. So we're going to um, uh, uh, get uh, in incomplete patterns warning. But independently of that warning, we do have the, the static error back. And again, it's a bad error, right? Because it, it, it says that, um, uh, yeah, well, basically, there is an atom int in the tree type um, underneath the constructor, and that must now be equal to unit because of this constraint, and that cannot be satisfied. So that's the error message we are getting. But we are back to a we're back to a static error at least. Okay, so I think this is an this is an interesting um, technique, and uh, and nevertheless, it is already showing that there are additional advantages of having this explicit representation kind because we can write like specify more about the shape that we expect things to be in um, but nevertheless as i hinted at multiple times there are uh, constraints that we have 
um, that should hold for all types, not just for enumeration types or other specific classes of types. And that is essentially that the sum and the product structure have to be layered in appropriate ways. And um, for this, we're going to, um, to introduce a, a separation between two kinds of representations, where we are going to say we have a sum representation and a product representation, and they are going to be separate and appropriately layered. Andres, before we move on, could yeah. we jump back to uh, resolve a couple little things? Yes, exactly. I, 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 I was already slowing down because okay. I would have <laughs> <laughs> asked you whether there are any questions at this point. Yeah. Yeah, can we jump back to the definition of S representation? Yes, we can. And, and I can also make the full screen S. again. S representation is here. Mm -hmm. So the, the question here was, um, why do we need the known symbol N, uh, you know, uh, proxy N, in, in the S constructor case? Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, can we not replace that by an actual string at the term level? By a string at the term level. So I guess instead of the proxy n, where n is constrained to be known symbol, could we not replace the proxy n with a just an actual string? That is right. In this particular case, we can, I think. I mean, if we are sure that the only thing we could possibly want to do with the symbol is to turn it into a string, which is the only application that we have been using it for, then we could do it. Um, because this is now always created sort of um, on the fly by the machinery. So we never have to produce it ourselves. So we could um, basically just embed the, the call to symbol val in the is representation class at this uh, appropriate point here rather than passing on this proxy. But it would um, remove a certain amount of flexibility, because actually having that symbol may still enable us to do certain other things, like, uh, for example, in, in a particular situation, comparing it with a different symbol, um, uh, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So um, so I think it does reduce the. Uh, the flexibility a bit, and I probably wouldn't want to do it. But for everything that we have seen so far, um, it would work, yes. Okay. Um, do you want to comment on the, the uses of uh, the, the tuple syntax? One of the things that you know, one, one person's noting is a bit confusing is we use you know, tuple syntax in multiple different ways. Do you want to just clarify? What those... Yes, I can. I can clarify this. I mean, so I, I mean, one point where we're using triple syntax is here because the interpretation of a product representation is an actual Haskell pair at the moment, and I think I guess what's in meant the, the other the other uh, different one is I just have to find it again. Sorry, now I'm getting confused about the order. This is collections of file. constraints. Right. Yes, the, um, as well as this is enum, yeah, here. It's where we're computing a, a constraint, is enum representation, and we basically want to say and. I mean, um, is in, uh, something is an is enum representation over some, uh, or some RS is, is an enum representation if both R is an enum representation and S is an enum representation. And we could also. Um, of course, the tuple syntax would still appear somewhere, but I said before, one can also combine multiple constraints into one, so I can show that briefly. Um, and, and the reason we use this tuple syntax here is because normal Haskell, or classic Haskell uses that same syntax for collecting multiple constraints on the left-hand side of a big array. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that is why GHC has introduced the um, basically these these um, you can you can use both unit that as I said at kind constraints and you can use um, arbitrary tuples at kind constraints if all the components are constrained. Um, that is um, that is overloaded syntax, unfortunately. Yeah, but if we if we extract uh, if we extract the combination of two constraints into one into this AND class, which may itself be triggering new questions, but uh, but then we could also 
um, have written this as, or can we even here? Because no, because we're using different uh, different arguments. No, I, I, that was not a good idea. Let's let me remove that again. Let's just accept the people syntax. Um, okay. Another question: Could could we have a product uh, instance for the is enum representation? Is it we can't, um, or that we're just choosing not to because it doesn't make sense? Yeah, I, I, I think the question is not whether we could, or not, uh, but we but we don't want to, right? I mean, so so essentially we want this constraint that is the result of this type family to fail if anything but a sum or a constructor occurs if the if the top level thing were um, um i mean it would not really be well shaped anyway because the way that we said things are constructed there must always be a constructor at a certain point but in particular if we ever hit a, a, a product thing it should not be satisfiable and um and right, so uh, simply not what we, what we could do what we could do is um, um is we could say anything else would give us a type error or something, right? So where type error is a is another GHC magic uh, type family where you can basically have a user defined type error occurring. Then it would um, not just sort of get stuck, um, but it would but actually it would tell you, naughty. No, no products. It doesn't make sense. It's not an enumeration. Okay. Anything else? Uh, I think that's it for now. Yeah. Okay. Oh, right. there was a, there was a more question that maybe you can say something about this. Um, when we were talking about enum earlier, um, yeah. it might be instructive to give an example of a valid or invalid use to maybe clarify what um, help understanding it. I don't know if that. So a valid use would be on color, right? And um, on 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 any enumeration type or on ordering or on boolean or on any data type you might define that has a generic instance and uh, is of this uh, shape as specified here that it is only a sum of constructors and then underneath the constructors there is no there are no argument no none of the constructors have any arguments and then then it is valid and the reason i couldn't call it now is because to save some time, I have not adapted the color type that was one of our example types to our current setting, and um, I could do that. But um, but otherwise, yeah, then 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 enum on color would work, um, and enum on tree should not work because it uh, is, of course, as I said in the very beginning, you can write generic enumeration for polynomial data types or for all sorts of types, and you can even try to do it in such a way that every Every value in the type, even for infinite types, is evaluated after a finite number of steps. And that is an interesting exercise in generic programming. Um, but yeah, um, uh, not what we're pursuing here. And there are, in general, quite a few generic functions you might want to write that should be specifically restricted to certain shapes of types. And it is nice if you can. Um, if you can make that more explicit, right? There are quite a number of operations that can only work on product types, for example. So the classical thing that is uh, a classical example that can only uh, work on product types is, is sort of um, monoid operations, mm -hmm. right? And they can easily be extended point-wise over all product types. If you have a monoid instance for every, if you, every, every component of your record or whatever, then you can you can lift that to a monoid instance for your entire. Uh, record quite easily, but for some types it is is very difficult to do, or or in general impossible to do. Um, and um, and you might want to 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 have these kinds of shape restrictions. And there are um, also for database interfaces. There's another thing that is typically often only doable on 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 product types, um, and and other things are only doable on some types or some other um, shapes. Yeah. And then. Um... Someone would like to see uh, more information about how to use um, a type error, but I think perhaps that's beyond the scope of what you want to. Uh, yes, about. I. I mean, this is this is more something for um, uh, an offline discussion outside of the session. I mean, if uh, if, if you find me elsewhere during Zuri Hack or or anybody else, um, uh, you, you, um, it's certainly more information to be shared there. But I think it goes beyond the scope of this. Perhaps provide a, a link in the. Uh... 
in the offline discussion. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. So I think looking at the time, um, and I, I do want to ideally get to the end, and knowing that the next step is just a whole lot of writing work, I will go to one of the pre-prepared files that I have. But let me let me just commit this. Um, uh, I don't know, um, representation time, something. And <clears throat> let me basically remove this stuff now and let me read section, I think it's 2.5. Hopefully, I've chosen the same names so that it won't be too confusing. And we're just going to look step by step at what's what's different. So as a starting point, I've had one representation kind, which had five constructors, some constructor, product, unit, and atom. Right. And I'm going to split that into two kinds now, one which is called some representation and one which is called product representation. And this is because, as I said several times before, all the representations that are actually going to be generated always have the sum structure on top of the product structure on top of the atoms, right? And uh, that layering is always the same. So the um, the old kind suggests far more freedom than we actually have. And um, uh, restricting that is more precise and in, in like sort of in the in the tradition of making incorrect states unrepresentable, um, this is this is uh, hopefully a step in the right direction. So some representation, if we have a sum, there are still two sum representations underneath. But as soon as we had a constructor, we're at a leaf as far as the sum structure is concerned. And there is a product representation underneath. And then the product representation has the other three constructors. Um, product has two product representations underneath. Unit has a unit. Um, it's, it's just unit and atom has a has a type, right? As before, and um, of course this carries through a lot of stuff. That's exactly why I didn't want to write everything by hand now, because interpret has to be split into two functions now. For example, right? Where we had one function, uh, one type family interpret before, we now have interpret sum for the sum representations and interpret product for the product representation, and interpret some calls, interpret product in the constructor case. But otherwise, nothing really has changed, right? Just splitting things into, into two layers. And then also, the S representation has to be split into two um, things, into S sum representation and S product representation. And again, this is the same thing. Nothing else changes but this split. We have the same five constructors, but now distributed over the two different um, types. And uh, again, the constructor case um, is actually embedding a product representation um, uh, descending to R into, into the other one. Apart from this, everything is exactly as before. And then also this class, is representation, has to be split into two classes. We have is sum representation, and we have is product representation, which I'm now also calling the, the methods. I'm also calling sum representation and product representation. That are these mechanically generated class-based things. Again, we have five instances in total, but now split over um, over two different classes, um, one for sum, one for constructor, one for product, one for unit, and one for atom. And the, um, and the, the structure of these is exactly as before, except for the split between sum and product. Okay, I hope this is, this is fine. And, um, and then we can leave the generic class alone, mostly, if we essentially say the 
if we define representation to now be a synonym for some representation, because the, the top level representation is going to be a sum representation. And if we define rep to be a synonym for interpret sum of code of A, we might want to go further and define like others, like interpret to be an, a synonym of interpret sum and representation to be a like lowercase representation to be a um, a synonym for lowercase sum representation and so on and so forth. But um, uh, that's uh, that's okay. And then nothing really changes with generic, and also the instance of generic doesn't really change at all. They just have more structure. I mean, we have less flexibility to do things wrong, if you like. And in, in this file, I actually have a, a color instance because I've pre-prepared that. And then if you if you look at EQ, that also has to be split into two functions now. And that makes it slightly worse than before again, because before we had everything in one and it was very compact. And now we have two layers again, one for the sum and one for the product. And, um, and but apart from that, again, nothing changes, right? I mean, the, we have exactly the same lines here, only that the recursive calls are to GEQ sum and GEQ products according to the only way that type checks. And the payoff, in a way, comes for um, uh, enum, right? Because for enum, we now only traverse the sum structure. And um, before, I mean, we I still have this is enum representation thing in there. Um, but before, we had a situation where uh, GHC was unable to see that that function is total, right? um, even though in, in, in practice it was. Um, but now it actually is trivially total, and, uh, because it really is a function that only traverses the sum representation. We never recurs into the product representation. We only have this one function here, and we only have two cases. So we have a question about, um, yeah. would it be possible to have a single representation data type? But with a GDT that tells mm -hmm. you whether you're in the sum or the product part? Yes, yes. I mean, uh, there are many cases in which you can uh, decide whether you want to um, like model something as, um, as, a, as a collection of potentially mutually recursive data types or as a single GADT that, um, that uses a tag to dispatch between them. That is yet another design choice. So I encourage you to just try. <laughs> Um, um, any more? Nope. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think it wouldn't it wouldn't make things substantially easier or harder. I mean, it, it, sure. I mean, in this particular case, it would perhaps have the advantage of still um, like being able to write GQ ultimately as a single function um, rather than as two separate functions. So that might be. Uh, a minor benefit of, of grouping them together in, in a GADT and using a tag to to distinguish. But um, but otherwise, it is more or less um, directly isomorphic. Um, OK. Um, right, so for enum, we get this payoff. But uh, I think this seems like perhaps a little, very little gain um, uh, for, for a high price that we're paying, right? I mean, even though I've now uh, shortened that work down considerably, but all this splitting just for um, uh, for for being able to write this as a single function. But but remember, I mean, so for one thing, it is really quite important that if something does not traverse the product structure, it should obviously like be a static error. And um, like even if we wouldn't use this as enum representation here now, we would have to do some other trickery in order to get it done. But it is, it's, uh, that is like, it's not to be underestimated, that benefit is what, I, what I'm trying to say. But there is another advantage that we're getting now, because now we can start looking at products and some separately. And perhaps that is giving us new ideas or new insights, right? And um, and there again, there are quite a number of things that we could be uh, that we could be doing next. I just want to um, highlight one aspect, and that is if we just look at GEQ products for the time being, just in isolation. This is now its own function. 
And if we, if we look at it, then what we're doing is, OK, in the product case, we are calling GEQ product on the left components of the pair, on the right components of the pair. In the unit case, we have two units anyway. We always say true. And then the atom case, we're, we're um, dispatching to, um, uh, to uh, essentially the, the original equality from the EQ class. But, but what we're really doing here on a higher level is we're taking two product structures that have the same shape and that is guaranteed by uh, the fact that they're both like um, driven by this S product representation EQR thing. They have to have the same shape, the same nesting of pairs, right? And we are zipping them together, essentially, uh, because we have twice the same shape. We're going through all the things basically in parallel. And whenever we hit atoms, we're zipping them with equality. And then we're getting a bunch of Booleans. And these Booleans are folded together using and and true, so essentially using and. Um, and that is a, is a sort of a higher level structure that um, well, was always there in a way, but it becomes more visible, I would say, by, by now looking at the products in isolation. And perhaps we could actually abstract from this, right? And, and say, well, there is a more general thing like zipping two product structures together with an operator. Perhaps we can, we can write that as an operation on products. And uh, and that would be good, right? Because so far we've always, every time we had to write a generic function, we said like, okay, there is this big case and what do we do here and what do we do there and what do we do there? And if you're learning Haskell for the first time, this is also what you're doing, I think. You're, you're um, yeah, learning about data types or you're learning about pattern matching and you're using a lot of like sort of explicit pattern matching and systematically defining functions. But as you become better, as you progress, you are very happy that you don't have to define every single Haskell function using explicit pattern matching and recursion. You're very happy that you have all sorts of higher order functions and powerful operators. And um, our generic programming world could use some of these, right? And, and here there is something that, that, that uh, uh, seems like it seems there, right? There seems to be some notion of zipping between products that we, we would want to. Um, make explicit, OK? So that is one thing that we're going to try to do um, to, um, to, to, uh, to make that even more precise. But there is one other thing that I want to first do, because there are more questions, of course. And that is just to look at these representations again. Right. And um, now that we have them split, I mean, even before, um, they're sort of strangely similar and strangely non-similar at the same time, right? So, um, so one thing that can probably be noticed is that it's a bit strange that we have this unit case here in the product structure, and unit is sort of one is the the unit of product, right? Of of times, but we don't have an appropriate case which would then probably be zero or empty or something for some. But that is really just an oversight on our part. And it should be there. And we should have done it. Because Haskell, these days at least, admits data types that have no constructors. Right? You can have a data type that has zero constructors. How do you represent a data type that has zero constructors? Well, you need another data type that has zero constructors in order to represent it, and, and ideally a single one, because we want to get away from all types being different. So we need a way for that. And actually, there should be sort of an empty case, which is then uh, interpreted as the void type. And then, um, and then these two structures become more similar, right? And then if we disregard just for the time being, the constructor names. And we'll bring them back at some point. But if we disregard them for a moment, then we see that really we, in both the sum and in the product representation, we have almost the same structure. right? We have um, either a binary combination of two 
things of the same thing. We have sort of a, uh, a nullary leaf and we have a unary leaf that dispatches to a, a single element. And if you squint at it and look at it yet a bit differently, then it's just sort of a tree-like representation of lists, what we are dealing with here. Really, the essence of a sum is that it contains a number of products in it, right? And the essence of our product is that it, they contain a number of types in them. And the binary nesting and how exactly that looks, that is actually not that important. And in fact, it even like gave us choices again where we didn't really know what to do when we had multiple choices, like which ways should we nest the either's. So do we even have to do that? I mean, can we not essentially go to a situation where we, um, let me comment all this out for the time being again. Um, and why does it actually complain about? Uh, it may just be an IDE glitch. Um, <clears throat> so um, can we basically just change this to make the list structure even more explicit? That is, that is the question here. So couldn't we rewrite some representation like this? either a cons sum, which contains a product representation, followed by another sum representation, or a nil sum, which corresponds to empty. That should be equivalent to this, right? Only a more systematic way, perhaps, of ordering things. And here as well, couldn't we do product representation and then we do pro cons product, and that takes a type and the product representation, or a nil product, which corresponds to unit, right? So rather than having this binary division with the atoms at the leaves, we always have um, a list-like structure where we have one of the underlying things, and um, uh, and then the rest. Okay. And well, if we are there, then we are so close to lists that we could actually consider using built in Haskell promoted lists instead. And to say some representation could just be. a type level list of product representations, because that's essentially what, what I've written just above. And product representation could just be a type level list of types. No double prime here. OK. Does that make sense? Are there any questions, Duncan? Um, so just going back a moment, um, one the question so <clears throat> says, uh, if I understand correctly, the idea is we can abstract the exact operation being performed uh, to not only use it for equality, but leverage the fact that we can provide any kind of operation as long as it's a zipping situation. But I think this is from earlier. I mean, you're leading up to. Um... Yeah, I'm, I'm going to like, I mean, yeah, we're, we're getting towards the end. We're but I, I hopefully stage, still won't we? be able to get back to that. Um, so the, the idea is that indeed, I mean, you you can you have this notion of zipping together two products. And then the in the equality case, what you're what you're conceptually doing, you're zipping two products together with the equals equals operation, then you get something that is like a list of Booleans as a result, and you're folding those Booleans just together using using the AND function, essentially, from the data.list library. And a, but a comparable example would be what I talked before already, would be um, uh, monoid operations or a semi-group uh, append operation, which you can lift on product structure. So if you already have an, 
uh, a semi-group operation on on all your component types, you can uh, you can like expand that to um, to a to to a product type to 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 any Haskell product type by pointwise um, applying the the semi-group operation to each of the components. And again, you're zipping together two product structures there. So that is essentially an instance of the same pattern. So it would be nice if we could express it using the same sort of like um, higher, higher level generic function. Okay. And then we've got a very detailed question about how one might do something with a lens, but uh, I don't know if... Um... How one might what? Uh, <laughs> Uh, rep representing something like a lens with a functor constra uh, constraint, um, but this may be a little bit too uh, too difficult to describe in words. Oh, this is about a, a lens itself being a generic type. I think that I'm not even sure. Yeah, I think that's something for for over beer or <laughs> yeah. I, um... But in, in, in general, I, I think, I mean, so one thing that you can very well do with generic programming, even with generic programming in the style we're discussing right now, is compute lenses, right? Um, comp even compute von Laerhoven lenses or profunctor lenses, uh, because then these types with the complicated constraints, they, they occur in the results of what you're computing, but they are not the thing that you are doing induction over. Mm. Um, but if you actually want to say, um, have a von Laerhoven lens and then derive a generic equality for it or something like that via its weird structure involving uh, higher uh, kind of type arguments and class constraints and whatsoever. I, I have never thought about this and I don't know what kind of operations they might generically support, but, um, but it's an interesting question. Any more? Um, one other last question here um, just came up. Um, how would we put back the constructor names here uh, by, yeah. for example, replacing the list of product representation with a list of symbol yeah. paired with product representation? Yeah. Uh, um, what you're leading up so, to as well. So, so um, that goes jumps a little bit ahead, but it's it's fine. So I mean, what? Let me let me just recap where we were, and then also um, answer that question at least partially. Um, so um, what we have done now is basically I've argued that rather than our previous uh, representations with the five different constructors, which really ought to be six, we could also go to a much simpler representation where we say uh, some representation is just a list of product representations and the product representation is just a list of types. You could even go as far as inline that and say it's a, a representation is just a list of list of types. Now, the price that we had to pay indeed was that we have been disregarding the constructor names here. And um, we can bring them back. And one way to bring them back is indeed to then go to a complica more complicated representation again, where we have pairs of symbols and lists of types or something like that. But there is a better way to bring them back. And I'm not 100% sure if we'll have time to get to this, but I hope. I just hope, but I um, I need to perhaps uh, uh, take fewer questions then. But, uh, but but if we don't get to this in here, it's definitely in the notes. I mean, it is it is written, it is explained in there how you how you can bring the constructor names back properly in that setting. So <clears throat> again, in order to uh, still be able to show as much as possible, let me try to. Um, just jump to, um, let me see, this one um, for a moment. Um, that is essentially the version that I have just been describing, where we say some representation is just a list of product representations, and the product representation is just a list of types. Okay. And then <clears throat> interpret some changes accordingly. So we now need something like a void type to interpret the empty list. But as I argued before, that's actually good. That was an oversight on our old thing. And now we still use either here for the for the cons case, 
to, to uh, establish a choice, but it's now an asymmetric choice because we have a list here. This is this left thing here is a is a product representation, and this right thing here is a sum representation. So we call interpret product, which interprets the structure of the first constructor, and interpret sum, which interprets the structure of the rest. Interpret product is also shuffling things a little bit around. The empty list is now interpreted as unit. And if we have a single atom, right, no, no longer marked specifically by atom, but this is what atom is, we interpret it as just the type itself, and the rest of the product is interpreted as a product, and uh, we use a pair. We still use a pair here. And then rather than having S sum and S product, it turns out that we can do with a single S list. And uh, that's quite interesting, where we um, have S list for both the sum and for both the product structure, and we may have to, we ha may have to nest it. And um, S list has a case for nil and a case for cons, right? Um, corresponding to the list nil and the list cons. And nil represents the empty list of an arbitrary constraint C, and cons represents um, x cons xs if we have um, a singleton for xs and if we have C of x as a constraint. And then is list is exactly the same as before, just for this s list type, right? We have um, just the normal instances for is list. And um, and that's it. And then it, it, it is worth looking at um, the generic instance for trees, for example, how that is affected. And it is looking um, like, I mean, the, the code is looking much more readable, hopefully, than, than it ever looked before, because we really have this list of lists now. And so we can see we have two constructors. The first one is an A. Um, it just contains an A, the second one contains two subtrees. And here we have slightly more noise again because the nested product is now a list-like thing, which always has a unit at the end. So even if we just have a constructor with a single um, uh, with a single uh, 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 constructor argument, we still have sort of a list-like structure expressed through nested pairs with a unit at the end. And um, and that's uh, that's giving us from and to, um, but uh, apart from that, it's yes, mostly the same. And color is similar. Color is uh, was an enumeration type with three arguments, uh, with three constructors. So the outer list has three elements. None of the constructors has any arguments. So the inner lists are all empty. And from and to for color looks looks entirely straightforward. Okay. And um, now we can try to, um, uh, to to define generic functions. But given the time, I actually want to to um, to move ahead and and not look at this, but immediately go one step further and say, um, if we want to do this zipping and these uniform operations on on products and sums, it really if you look at GEP product again for a moment, this is GEP product, just uh, GEQ product, just this one. This is still notionally the zipping. I mean, it's already looking rather nice the way it is, but um, uh, it's still notionally the zipping of, of products together with equality and then folding using, using and. Um, but if we wanted to write a zip product now, we would have to do something like we get an interpret product over R and we get another interpret product over R. And we would need um, something in the components that can deal with um, various different types that appear within the product. But we know because of this S list, CR in the beginning, we know that all the components at least satisfy C, or in the case of GEQ product, they satisfy EQ. So we 
can say if we have a function that works on everything that satisfies C and then combines an X with an X and then gives us some constant result type A, then we can turn two products into a list of A by essentially doing the same thing that we do up here, right? applying this rank two polymorphic thing, right? this operator, to all the elements in, in this position. And then rather than immediately anding together everything, we collect the things in a list. And then we can decide later, as an independent operation, what we want to do with the list. But what's not so nice about this is that um, we are treating the inputs and the outputs asymmetrically. right? Um, so we're saying, OK, so the inputs are products, but the output has to be of a constant type. And then we collect the elements in a list. But a list is almost like a product. right? And what if we have an operation that doesn't go from x to x to a, like equality, but like um, a semi-group append that goes from x to x to x? Then we would like to like have almost the same function zip product that goes from a product and another product to an actual other product. And this is the point where it makes sense to abstract once more, and this is another big step, over the kind of things that can be occurring in the sum and in the product. At the moment, we essentially still leave it fixed that within a sum, there's always a product. Right? That's also here in our interpret function. Within a sum, there is always a product. And within a product, there is always a type. But what if we would abstract over this? And I'm very sorry that I have to um, like do this without more detail, given the, the fact that we are almost at the end. But it, I think we are so close that it makes sense to basically just show this. The idea is that we abstract over a type constructor that everything within a sum can be wrapped in and everything in the product can be wrapped in. If you think about the way that we represented sums so far, they basically were nested either's, right? They were still nested either's, even though we nested them in a list-like structure. And we said left, and then we either had one element, or we said right, and then we had the rest of the sum structure. And we're going to use a GADT instead now, where left is played, the role of left is played by zero. Where we say we have to the we have our we take the first choice, but now rather than that we fix that there is a product of x in here, we actually say there can be an arbitrary f of x in here, and in particular that f may be a product. Or we go to the right, and then we have the rest of the sum structure. And for product, we also um, introduce a GADT that is parameterized by a constructor f. And nil plays the role of, um, what was it called just now, um, um, of, unit, of the unit type, right? We used the, the unit at, and cons plays the role of the, of the nested pairs. And so basically, we represented products as nested pairs with a unit at the end to mark the end of the list. And here, we just have a heterogeneous list where every element is, is wrapped in an, in an F. And that is the, the sort of the, the, the final version as far as we are concerned today. And then um, uh, the cool thing is that we can write interpret now um, no longer via two different type families, but we can really just say the outer list should be um, like XSS is a list of list of types, right? The outer list should be interpreted as a sum. The inner list should be interpreted as a product. And everything within the product can also be wrapped but we normally wrap it in the identity type constructor. And that is saying we don't want it. But another cool choice, rather than the identity type constructor, is the constant type constructor. And if we consider the situation of uh, generic equality on products, 
right? We, we take two products, each of the components are wrapped in the identity, but we get back a product where everything is constant pool. And, um, and using this additional abstraction of a type constructor, we can combine all these notions of zipping into one. And I can, I can show this as an example. S-list does hardly change. The uh, generic representation does change a bit because we use zero and suck rather than left and right. And we have these identity constructors with, which are a bit of noise, right? Um, but apart from that, they, they hardly change. But now we can write, now we can write a generic operation that zips two products together. And we, this is, this is working on, in all situations. So if we have a product of Fs and we have a product of Gs, we can turn it into a product of Hs. If we have something that takes a single F of X and a single G of X into a single H of X, and we can assume that there is a constraint that is fulfilled for that X. And the definition is really just very close to zip width on lists, right? It's not very different. Um, because that is essentially what it is, just on a on a richer list-like structure. And you can define different operations. Um, <clears throat> you can define collapse product, collapse sum. Like if you have a product of only constant values, you can turn it into an ordinary list. If you have a sum of only constant values, then there is a single A in it, and you can extract it. Um, you can, if you have an operation that works for all elements that satisfy a particular class, think for example, again, monoids, m empty, you can conjure up a product out of thin air that invokes that operation on every um, position. And then in, you can rewrite your generic functions in this style. And um, so GQ product, if we just again look at that, then can be written as a one-liner, which really zips together the two products. There's a little bit of overhead with these identity and constant type constructors. So there's this coerce call in here, but we're zipping two products together with the equality operation. Then we get a product that contains constant types, so we can collapse it into a list, and then we can use the AND operation on lists. And that is, what I mean by using like higher order functions in order to construct new generic functions out of old ones and the benefit you're gaining by separating the sum and the product structure properly that allows you to think about this. Now, I'm sure there are probably a number of questions, but I want to backtrack to a number of old questions. So one question I want to briefly answer, this is basically the end, right? This is, this is very close to what generics SOP is doing. Right, and uh, generics SOP, like before with GHC generics, uses slightly different names, but the names don't matter, the ideas matter, right? Um, uh, it's essentially um, the approach that generics SOP is taking. So one question was about metadata. And now this is easy to answer. So how do we bring back the constructor names? The, um, the answer is we don't embed them into the structure at all. We have so much structure now that we can just separately provide them. So I have that here. You can, if you limit yourself to constructor names as we've done before, you can say, what I really just need is a product of strings, of constant strings of the right size that gives me the constructor names of all the components, right? And you can, similarly to how you can automatically derive generic for all the data types, you can also automatically derive this has data type info class, which contains metadata like this. And then you have it available as a product of the right shape in the cases you need it. And if you want to write a function that uses these, you just basically zip them or fold them into whatever you're doing, and they fit together, and you can access them as you uh, as you need them. And uh, you can do a similar thing with uh, with record field labels and uh, with the data type name itself. So you don't have to make your structure that is so nicely uh, simple now, that is just a list of list of types. You don't have to actually make that worse again, because it gives you enough information to provide this 
uh, metadata information separately for you to use just when you when you need them. And you don't need to burden all the generic functions that don't need metadata with it at all. OK. So that is um, that is the point of our constructor names. And then I basically probably owe a final word on, on uh, performance once more. So of course, the performance here has become worse. I mean, it's also not gone up again. There are certain changes one could make. I mean, again, the, the main difference, why is it worse? Well, um, from and to are still non-recursive. But even though we now have products and <clears throat> some separately, all these individual operations that we're doing on them, whether you do direct recursion on them um, or whether you use collapse product and zip product and whatever, these are all recursive functions on this, these structures. And they, they don't inline. Now, there are multiple tricks you can try to play. You can use a, a class-based system underneath again in order to try to enable some inlining and hide it from the user, because on the outside, they could still use these high-level combinators. You could try to apply some form of fusion, because these are well-behaved structures, and there is a good theory. And under certain circumstances, you ought to just be able to fuse things together and, um, and deforest intermediate structures, similarly how you do for lists. Um, but it's tricky, and it, it expects uh, a lot from the optimizer. So currently, and that's sort of the, my, my final one, currently I'm um, becoming a believer in, in staging, um, uh, where staging is essentially template Haskell, but with types, and then restricted to a particular subset, where um, all splices and all quotations are properly typed, and you are still guaranteed to only generate type correct code. But you get a guarantee that certain things happen at compile time. And you can nicely combine generics SOP with staging uh, in such a way that you can basically write functions more or less in exactly the style that I've been showing them to you. Um, but because of the staging that is being employed, you have more or less a guarantee. You don't have to trust GHC's heuristics and that the inliner does the right thing. You have more or less a semantic guarantee that the behavior of um, the stuff will be optimal in the end. But unfortunately, this requires some changes to GHC because it requires some additions to type template Haskell, which are in the works. So it is a story for another day and not today. OK. So indeed, one of the, one of the questions that came up earlier was, was a sort of you know, comparison question of the style of generic programming versus, versus template Haskell. Yes, yeah. So um, that is actually a, a good point. I mean, I don't exactly know. I mean, I'm happy to answer more questions as they come here. I'm just not sure whether there is a technical reason for why we have to end the stream at some point. But um, let, let's just go on for, for, for a bit. Um, so um, the relation to template Haskell. So indeed, I mean, there, there are a couple of things. <clears throat> There, there's a lot. There's a lot to say about this, unfortunately. <laughs> yes. um, so, so first of all, um, there are a couple of things that only template Haskell can do, and uh, and that will probably um, remain that way. Only template Haskell can introduce new names in 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 a top level um, declaration. So, with template Haskell, you can write something that defines a new data type, that defines a new function, that has a, an actual name, and um, and some of some of the generic constructions are really more uh, are nicer if you can immediately attach them to names. So, for example, lenses. If you um, if you have a if you consider um, a, a record data type and you have record labels, you you typically want the lenses to be automatically accessible. Um, uh, just by a simple first class name. And, and there is this convention that you under, underscore prefix, and then the prefix is removed or something like that. And that is something that only template Haskell can do. And if you um, want to do things generically, like for example, in the case of generic lens, you have a library that does it using generic programming, you don't get something like that. And the, the best thing you can do is to invoke a generic function with a type level argument. And the type level argument could be a symbol. 
that refers to the component. And then if you want to have that available as a name of your own, you have to bind it manually. So in that sense, template Haskell um, has some functionality that um, probably like pure generic programming will never get. But on the other hand, if you use template Haskell for everything, um, it gets very undisciplined very easily. And then undisciplined, I don't mean like necessarily in order to um, to badmouth the, the authors, but it's really hard also to maintain. Template Haskell changes all the time. Like you have to go to the to the syntactic level. Um, you, you are using the declaration syntax. You are doing everything at a very low syntactic level. You have to worry about a lot of things. It's very easy to, um, to make mistakes. Um, not necessarily mistakes in functionality, but mistakes in the sense that um, it suddenly doesn't work for certain data types that you expected it to work for, or or this sort of stuff, and it's very hard to test as well. So, um, so it's um, I think uh, generic programming in general is a much more disciplined approach, but um, probably ideally, if you look at the the, the performance question, the the best way in the end is to combine. Um, template Haskell to some extent with generic programming um, on the other hand, with generic programming essentially giving you the, the high level interface, right? So that you can write things in, at, a, at a high level and um, semantically rather than syntactically, um, but with template Haskell giving you the performance guarantees underneath. And you mentioned typed template Haskell, which not Yeah, and typed template Haskell is, uh, is already Sort of a, a a good a good step in that direction because uh, I mean type template Haskell um, is 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 not very widely known unfortunately but it exists since many many years it has a number of rough edges because it's not very widely used but it does work in principle and um, uh, it it basically restricts yourself to the expression level subset and uh, it's particularly well suited for for writing high-level code that is tailored towards performance, right? I mean, I, I see temp type template Haskell really as essentially something that is primarily intended to give you a performance boost, not as a, a thing to, to generate lots of code for you. That you can do with Haskell already, like generic programming, right? And then there is this other thing, this, this declaration level stuff, which you can only do with template Haskell, like introducing new names. But again, that's a relatively small part. And like yet a few more years further, one can perhaps try to like um, to find a nice interface between the various different levels so that you can write almost everything at a very high level and then use a little bit of, let's say, ugliness just where it's needed. I don't think there are any other um, particular specific questions. Um, right, OK. I can perhaps um, at the end for people who have joined late or something, I can say again, there is a repository um, at github.com well typed gp siri hack 2020 that um, has all the code, that has sort of clean files for the various um, iterations we've gone through. It also has this gp.hs, which I've been editing in and committing a couple of times. And in most of all, it has this gp.pdf, which is uh, a PDF version of um, all the stuff that I've been talking about, including some exercises, some of which are very hard, I have to say. I mean, I haven't, uh, they're not, unfortunately, nicely layered for beginners to, you have to, don't, don't think that you, if you start them, have to do them in order or you have to try them all because some of them are very work intensive and others are really quite simple. But there are a couple of ideas for things to do, let's say. And of course, I'm, um, I'm happy to answer questions later on outside of the session. On, uh, yeah, I think that'll uh, be useful because I think there are a lot of people who uh, now have um, um, uh, yeah, head blown syndrome and need to rewatch the last third of the talk and go through the PDF. So, uh... OK, yeah, thank you, everyone, for for the patience and uh, sorry for not having uh, done even a five minute break in between. I know that is uh, quite stressful. I feel exhausted as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, looking forward to further discussions and uh, thank you so far.
Okay, let's wrap up then. Thanks very much. Um.